Okay, we're live. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Explain Apologetics. I'm Samuel Nason. Uh, proud to introduce to you two speakers that have both been on our channel before to discuss today uh, textual uh, criticism, particularly dealing with the Texas receptors. Uh, we do uh, trying to get uh, indication if we are live at the moment. So just pardon me one second as we sort this out. All right, we are live indeed. I just got that confirmation. So thanks. Uh, well, once again, welcome to Explain Apologetics. And uh, it's a joy to bring to you uh, a discussion on the Texas receptors. We realize there's a lot of big words. And ever as we promoted the event, we kept getting a lot of questions as to what on earth is the Texas receptors. Well, uh, if you're one of those persons that you feel this is a question that you're you're not quite even sure what this is about. Do stay tuned. We, we, we hope to be able to break this down uh, and, and explain to you, uh, particularly dealing with the doctrine of preservation as well. Uh, is the Bible being corrupted? And also, for those of you who are in Malaysia, you've heard the statement by YB Zawawi on the, the Bible has been diubah or uh, distorted, changed. We'll be responding to that too at the end of this program. But before that, uh, I'm Samuel Nason. I just want to introduce to you uh, two of our panelists today. First up, Dr. James White. Uh, as uh, some of you may already know, no need any introduction, but I'll introduce him nonetheless. He is the, uh, he's the lead apologist at Alpha Omega Ministries. He is a prominent Christian debater, having debated extensively across the world. He's the author of the King James Only Controversy, uh, a very controversial book. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, and also, uh, he's been here on this channel before the last time uh, in a four-way debate. This won't be his last time, I can tell you, on this channel. Uh, he'll be up uh, again on this channel at least two more times uh, in uh, October uh, as he does the debate with Dr. Jeff Riddle. So pleasure to have you on, Dr. James White. Well, it's good to be back with you. And uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I think it's extremely important, very basic to an understanding of the history of the Bible and a defense of the faith. And it's interesting that the question has come up uh, in regards to an Islamic statement. This is a subject that I have debated in mosques in South Africa, in, uh, uh, in, in Australia, London, uh, all over the world, literally. And so hopefully we can shed some light on that and, and uh, help Christians understand exactly what the issues are. Right. This also happens to be an area that you're working on your PhD on at the moment uh, in South Africa, if I understand correctly. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Right. Yeah. I, um, uh, there's a tremendous textual scholar in Pachastun, South Africa, uh, Dr. Yordan, who did his PhD under Metzger at Princeton. And uh, I'm sort of in a hiatus simply because uh, I'm what I'm studying is the, the new system called CBGM, Coherence-Based Genealogical Methodology, in light of the early papyri. So for example, I'm focused upon P45, which is a very unusual manuscript that we have that contains portions of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. It's the only manuscript we have that has that combination, interestingly enough. But I'm sort of in hiatus right now because of the lockdowns, I, I guess, um, I'm waiting for the next portion of data to be published out of Munster. And I was told in January of 2019, they were ready and it still hasn't come out yet. So we're just sort of spinning our wheels, biding our time. Uh, but it's a, it really is the future of uh, New Testament textual criticism. Uh, the current uh, Greek New Testament that most translations are based upon, the Nessie Allen 28th edition, um, has already been impacted by CBGM. Uh, maybe if we have time, we can talk about what, what some of those are. And once Mark comes out and you have a gospel that is impacted by CBGM, I think there's going to be more discussion about what the methodology involves. Uh, but it's extremely difficult to explain in a brief period of time. So anyways, yeah, that's um, I'm looking forward to getting back to that um, once the world does whatever the world is going to do uh, over the next number of months. And none of us knows what that's going to be. Absolutely. We, we, we had Dr. Don Wilkins on this channel as well, and he kind of brought that up as uh, he was talking about uh, NASB 2020 coming out. Um, and and that, that, that topic did come up as well, but we didn't get to go into that in detail as that will require a live stream of its own. But thanks, Dr. White. And also, uh, the other panelist we have on uh, today's program is uh, Dr. Stephen Boyce, who also uh, is doing his PhD, not his first, 
but his second PhD focusing on the canon of scripture. It's a joy to have you with us, Dr. Stephen. Good to be back, Samuel. Uh, yeah, definitely working on the second one and the last one. I am burned out with doing research papers and so forth. I'm currently about two thirds done with my dissertation. I'm working on a manuscript in Jerusalem called Codex H, which contains a lot of the end of the first century, second century readings of first Clement, second Clement, which was probably not Clement, the Didache, the seven letters of Ignatius and um, uh, the epistle of Barnabas and actually going through each one of those readings and seeing how they cited the old and new Testament scripture comparing them to the Nassau edition and the Byzantine text, as well as the uh, Septuagint and looking at the differences and seeing how they quoted the scripture. If it was uh, more of a summary or were they quoting it, or did it look like they were copying a manuscript and kind of looking at the different variances and how they quoted. It's been a very interesting study. Uh, some of the times you can see that uh, the writers have recently, when I grew up, that the second century fathers quoted a primary Byzantine reading. Uh, but actually, it's not fully accurate to say that. Though there are some Byzantine readings at times, it's not exactly like the Byzantine readings we have today. Uh, also, uh, they quoted what's relatable to similar uh, papyri, like P45 was just mentioned, P46. Uh, a lot of the fathers quoted statements that have unique readings found in the older manuscript papyri. So it's been a fun uh, I'm ready to be done, but it's been fun uh, to, to go through that. But most of my focus has also been on the canon, uh, looking at the New Testament canon, Old Testament canon. It's been actually one of the most uh, recent uh, interviews that I do is typically on the canon. Most time when I'm invited, uh, that's the first thing I get invited to. But this subject is important to me because I grew up in a TR only uh, movement. I believed the TR was the inerrant, infallible, inspired, preserved word of God. That was literally the exact replication, uh, re the representation of the original autographs themselves. Uh, and I believed that for quite a while, even in the first church I pastored when I started pastoring at 22. And uh, I just honestly just started studying things for myself. And uh, one thing led to two and two to three. Uh, and after a while, I gave this guy a chance uh, and I read a book. You may have never heard of it. It's probably not that important, but uh, <laughs> I, I gave the guy a, a chance and I actually read it, which led me down a path that has not yet changed. Uh, so it's a fun study. Textual criticism is also a part of my degree. I do a lot of studying in that field as well. Um, but the TR discussion is important to me. And I know there's quite a few people watching right now who are on the fringes, who are asking a lot of questions. And so one of the things that I realized a few years ago, as well as John Beasley with City Light Seattle, which I do apologetics and research for that network there, uh, is that there were hundreds of emails coming in on the subject we're going to be talking about tonight. Young guys that grew up in the same kind of schools and backgrounds that I did who were asking legitimate questions and were not getting good answers in their seminaries and universities. And so I felt like it was time to start tackling this issue. It's not been a fun experience. It's been very painful. But nonetheless, uh, we've seen a lot of young guys and girls change their views, not because they need to follow some trend, but because they actually thought outside of the box and pursued the truth. And that's exactly what we want to represent today is the truth. Well, absolutely. Well, thanks. for. I was actually planning to ask you a little bit about your own journey in this, but you kind of answered that question as well uh, with the first one. It's a joy to have you. We know you're addicted to PhDs, and we also know you're addicted to this channel. Uh, you've spoken here the first time on the canon of scripture as well and uh, we know this won't be the last time we'll be seeing a lot more of you uh, so uh, guys those of you who are watching in the live stream you can participate in the q a as i'm just going to explain how this is going to go down i'm just going to get into some preliminary questions with dr white we're going to start off uh, with on on the on the texas receptors to get them to explain what is the texas receptors some of you watching this may have never heard of these words the byzantine text uh, texas receptors p45 uh, well, we're going to break that down for you, and uh, hopefully, uh, by God's grace, you're going to be able to follow through to this. We're going to be tackling uh, four, at least four passages of Scripture, Luke 2, 22, Acts 8, 37, 1 John 5, 7, and Revelation 16, 5. Uh, and uh, as we go on, you kind of know why we're tackling this, these four, but I do want to say something very important because some people have been asking me, why not have a TR-only advocate uh, who believes in the Texas receptors only uh, that it has been the 
providentially preserved text, why not have someone come on the panel as well? Well, uh, in short, we will be doing a debate on this subject on October, the first weekend of October, and links to those two debates, uh, not one, but two debates, are in the description box. Dr. James White will be debating uh, Dr. Jeff Riddle, who uh, I've got to know throughout the last couple of months, a uh, really wonderful person. And uh, those two uh, debates will be on this channel as well. So do stay tuned to that if you want to hear the other side. This interview is a buildup for that debate. So with that said, for those of you in the live chat, you can uh, basically your questions are going to be addressed. What we will do instead is we'll focus on each passage, one of the four passages. And as we focus on the passages, if you want to ask questions on the passages, uh, you can do so and we'll answer them based on the passages before we open up to a general Q&A at the end of the program. So. With that said, uh, let's start off uh, with uh, Dr. White. Uh, just maybe let's begin by asking you, for those of us who never heard that word before, what is the Texas Preceptus? Right. Well, uh, let's. this is a historical uh, inquiry, a historical subject. And so let's point out that the initial utilization of that phrase, it's a Latin phrase, it means the received text was found in a advertising blurb uh, for the 1633 printing of what had become a pretty much standardized uh, Greek text coming out of the preceding century from the work primarily of Desiderius Erasmus, the Dutch humanist scholar, uh, who was a Roman Catholic priest. And he produced five editions uh, in his lifetime, the last of 1535. Then the work of Stephanus or Robert Estian, who was Calvin's printer in Geneva. And much to the chagrin of many of my TR only advocates, I have a 1550 Stephanus. Uh, this is not a, um, a replica. This is a 1550 Stephanus. Uh, it was printed in 1550. Uh, I had it rebound last year because the cover fell off uh, the original one finally after 470 some odd years or whatever. Uh, Jeffrey Rice did this. If you've seen Jeffrey Rice rebind Bibles, we trusted him to do this. Did a beautiful job, uh, and it drives people nuts uh, that I <laughs> that I have that. Um, that uh, 1550 was the last printed edition before Stephanus introduced verse divisions into the New Testament, and so it was very widely used and uh, very popular with many many people in, in that time period. And then Theodore Beza, who was Calvin's successor in Geneva, uh, was very interested in textual critical issues. And he produced a number of editions. And his 1598 edition was especially popular in the United Kingdom. And all of those, the five editions of Erasmus, the editions of Stephanus, the editions of Beza, were the printed foundation of the translation of the King James Version between 1604 and 1611. So, the King James translators were not focused upon doing a new version of the Greek New Testament or analyzing uh, handwritten manuscripts and things like that. They were primarily dealing with the translation of uh, printed editions, but there were different groups that produced the King James Version of the Bible. And so you might have had a, a group working on the Gospels and a group working on Paul, that might have been one group might have had an emphasis upon Erasmus, another uh, Stephanus, another Beza. You, you don't, it's, it's sort of hard to tell necessarily exactly where they were coming from. So there wasn't just one absolute base text. What happened is you have uh, reprintings of the work that comes out of because Stephanus uses Erasmus, uh, Beza uses Erasmus and Stephanus, um, and there are differences. There isn't any, the problem is there isn't any one Textus Receptus. Most of the time when people think of the Textus Receptus, they think of this. It's the little blue case bound Trinitarian Bible Society version um, that comes from Scrivener. And what Scrivener did, what's fascinating is this isn't actually a Greek New Testament. It is a Greek New Testament based upon the translational decisions and textual decisions of an English translation that was based upon all those other printed texts that I just mentioned to you. What Scrivener did is he went back and he collated Erasmus and Stephanus and Beza. And then he looked at the King James and said, okay, what did the King James translators choose? Because there are differences. 
There are differences between Erasmus's editions. There are differences between Erasmus and Stefano's, between Erasmus, Stefano's, and, and Bezer. They're not huge differences, but there are differences. And so what he did, what this is, is this is Scrivener going back and going, ah, here's a difference between these. What the King James translators choose? That's what I'm putting in here. So this is the Greek text underlying the King James text, but this didn't exist in 1611. This comes after 1611 and is based upon the textual choices of the King James translators. Now that, that's important to understand. There is a history here. And so what people need to understand is we live in a day that is unlike anything that's come before us. Right now, you can pick up your phone, and I'm sure Stephen has the same programs that I do and access the same databases, things like that. You can pick up your phone, and we know where manuscripts are. We know what museum they're in, what university they're at. There is an entire uh, catalog of manuscripts. They have each an identifying number, uh, date range, what they contain, and thanks to CSNTM and Dan Wallace and the guys down there, uh, more and more of these manuscripts are now available to us to examine online ourselves in super high resolution photography. Uh, that's just, just fantastic. But we need to realize that kind of information has never existed before. When Erasmus did what Erasmus did, there weren't established catalogs. Nobody knew where manuscripts were. He moved to Basel, Switzerland, hoping, hoping the university there would have a bunch of manuscripts and they didn't have anywhere near what he expected them to have. Um, so the, the ability that we have today to collate manuscripts, to compare readings, this is a very modern ability. When, when Scrivener was doing what he was doing, um, he didn't have the electronic resources that we have. And so it was a huge amount of work to do the kind of stuff that, that these scholars are doing, even just in the 19th century. So we have access to so much more than they had back then. So when you think about how many manuscripts and what kind of manuscripts went into the production of this, at least historically, we know that Erasmus didn't have more than a dozen and the oldest ones he didn't trust as much as younger ones. And we, we know most of the manuscripts that he used, we are still learning some stuff, just learned something recently about one of the sources that he used in light of the reading in Ephesians 3.9, for example. Um, and then Stephanus had a few others, and then Beza had a few others, but still in comparison to what any textual scholar has access to today, the textual basis that was utilized to produce the readings of what becomes known today as the Texas Receptus, very, very minimal in comparison to what we have. And based upon a text that dates well after AD 1000. So remember, none of the papyri manuscripts that, that are so important to us today and are, are apologetically so relevant to us today because we can demonstrate the antiquity of the text and things like that, None of those were available. Those don't, don't, don't become available until the 1930s, uh, so but barely 100 years. Um, Erasmus did know about Codex Vaticanus, what he called the, the, Vatic, the Vatican Codex, uh, but he did not really have direct access to it to be able to utilize it. He would have if he had had that kind of access, but he didn't. And so we're in a different day today. And so what concerns me is there is a movement to go back to establishing this as the ultimate authority in New Testament translation, preaching, and teaching. And the reasoning behind it is primarily a theological reasoning. Uh, there is a, a dislike of modernism. There is a dislike of uh, the unbelief of modern skeptical theories and things like that. But the problem is we are living in a day of people like Bart Ehrman who can bring an entire uh, catalog of, a, of attacks against the New Testament. At that very time, we have the most information we've ever had. And yet the TR only movement is saying, let's go back. Let's go back to a text that represents a small number of manuscripts and contains readings that, as we'll discuss this evening, really are not historically defensible. And this requires a theological conclusion 
that something special happened in the 16th century and something special did happen. It's called the Reformation. But did that change the text of scripture? Um, what, was there something special? Was there some type of providential guidance uh, that the right manuscripts just happened to end up in Basel, Switzerland uh, or in Geneva um, rather than any place else, London or, or any other major city or things like that. And so obviously my concern is I deal, as we're going to talk about later, I deal with Islam a great deal. And there is a parallel movement to TR onlyism uh, in Islam. And that you can see it. Just watch, watch the debates I did with Adnan Rashid in London a number of years ago. Uh, and you'll hear Adnan at one point say, hey, if I can get back to Uthman's text, that's good enough for me. That's the traditional text. That's the, uh, the, the current Arabic text used mostly in Western countries. Um, it goes back to a, the Cairo edition from 1924. And that's what they consider to be, in essence, providentially preserved. And so there is a pushback from any Muslim to where you would ask questions about, well, what manuscripts were used to produce that? What scholars were involved? Is that the earliest text? Uh, what about what Ibn Masud said, et cetera, et cetera. Those are, there's a real strong, no, we don't wanna, we don't wanna go there uh, type of an attitude there as well. And so I have to deal with not only the Bart Ehrmans and the skeptics, but believing people in other traditions and other religions, I have to be consistent. And so that's where my concern about this issue of the, of the text is receptus. So fundamentally, how we're using it today is the Textus Receptus is the underlying Greek text used to translate the King James and the New King James version of the Bible, which is different from the modern Nessiarum 28th edition. It's also different from what's called the majority text, uh, and it's different from the Byzantine priority text uh, as well. And so there are a few Greek New Testaments out there, but the vast majority of people's Bibles, they're NASB, ESV, NIV, uh, Christian Standard Bible, et cetera, et cetera, are all translated from what is today known as the eclectic text or the critical text or the Nestle Allen text, UBS fifth edition text, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where the, the, the issues lie. One fast thing, I know I've spoken too long, but that's a lot to try to cover really quickly. One last thing, and I'm sure if Stephen uh, agrees with me on this, at least I hope so, <laughs> we'll find out here soon. Um, even if we listed all of the key texts, if we, if we talked about the longer ending of Mark, uh, we talked about the Pericope Adultery, John 7, 53 through 8, 11, we talk about uh, the Kami Yohani in 1 John 5, 7, which we're doing, Luke 2, 22, Revelation 16, 5, Revelation 14, 1, Ephesians 3, 9, even if we put them all out there, the fact of the matter is, this is my Tyndale House Greek New Testament, okay? This is fairly new. And their whole, their primary thing was a reading has to be attested in the first 500 years of the manuscript tradition for it to appear in here. All right. So here's a very ancient based text. Here's the Textus Receptus basically representing the state of the text in the 16th century. If you apply the same hermeneutical principles of interpretation to these two texts, you will have the same message, the same faith. Are there theological, is there theological relevance to the variants? There is some, not overly major. The, the, the message is gonna be the same. The only thing that's gonna change, for example, as to whether you have God at John 118 or son at John 118 is the list of verses that you would give that identify Jesus as God uh, because there's also a, a text in 1 Timothy 3.16 where it goes the other direction. The, the list would change a little bit, but the doctrine doesn't change. And this, I think, is extremely important for people to understand. The textual variants do not change the gospel message, who is Jesus, uh, any, of these, any of these issues. And we as Christians are wide open. I mean, anyone can buy... Uh, any one of these texts, well, the 1550 might be a little pricey, but uh, anyone can buy any of these texts and, and utilize these websites and uh, check out the textual variants. We're wide open about it. We need to be uh, because we believe that this is the way that God has preserved his text 
is in the manuscript tradition, not in preserving one particular manuscript over here on a mountaintop someplace uh, that we then have to have reference to. Well, thanks, Dr. James White, for that uh, you know, elaboration on uh, what is the Texas Receptus, particularly the historical context. Um, that might be really helpful to some of our viewers uh, who are wondering what, on, what, what, it, what, what it is. Um, I do want to go to Dr. Uh, Stephen Boyce um, and, and maybe ask you, Dr. James White, towards the end of that, uh, was, was mentioning about the theological idea of preservation, you know, the idea that God preserves his word. He, he spoke about the parallel between Christianity and Islam, uh, or actually rather more of the TR onlyism and Islam that believes, for example, that uh, theologically, no matter what the, the, the manuscript evidence is, for example, theologically, uh, we believe that God has preserved his text. Um, and we can accept that on the basis of the faith. How does the TR relate to that uh, in terms of uh, the doctrine of preservation? How does the TR come in? Um, and is it, is it maybe fair, just to add on another question to that, is it fair to say that Christians lost the word of God until, for example, the modern critical text? Well, it's, it's an amazing concept to think about because I had the understanding for the longest time that if, say, Acts 8.37 did not belong in the text, then we don't have a Bible. All the Bible is in jeopardy based on that one text. The truth of the matter is, Dr. White just said it a minute ago, less than 2% of all textual variances that are considered viable and meaningful that actually change the text, we're talking about less than 2% is all that would be in that category that would allow us to say, okay, these are the serious ones. Now, one of the things that the TR movement has done, and I was a victim of this as well, is they have minored on the major and they have majored on the minor. They spend all their time defending that 2% regardless of the evidence. And they have to change their tactic of defense from one verse to the other. They, they do not have a set standard to use textual criticism off of the evidence because their argument will be a Latin argument in 1 John 5 but it will not be a part of their argument later on when you're going into other passages like Luke's gospel, or especially in Revelation. So the thing is with the TR is there is no boundary. It is a tradition that guides them. And one thing that I've often told a lot of the guys that have come to me and asked me questions, when I grew up thinking a certain way, my mindset was, what did the church have for the last 400 years? That's where I started. Now, my challenge to guys and girls who come to me is, no, 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 we need to start with what did the church have in the first 400 years? And what evidence do we have that has survived antiquity in those 400 years so that we can see what a New Testament would have looked like from that point of history? We don't need to start in the last 400 years. We need to go way back, further than the last 400 years. Uh, and what people need to understand about the TR is that a lot of these guys that published these TRs, Stephanus, Erasmus, and Beza, later Mills. Mills put together, he, he collated over 80 manuscripts to give us a slight apparatus of textual variances. He was one of the first ones that actually gave the idea that there are variances in the text. And he tried to document that in his 1707 edition. All of these guys were looking for truth. Erasmus updated his editions five times. Stephanus had four editions. Beza had numerous editions. You look at guys like Scrivener. Uh, Scrivener was not interested in believing that what he was putting down was the final text. Like, this is it. This is God's word. There's not, th not a word that should be added or taken. In fact, Scrivener did not agree with some of the readings he put in his own text. He disagreed with certain readings, like in Matthew 16. He questioned the Kama Yohanim. He questioned some of these. He, he would have rejected some of the verses that we're talking about tonight. Was he limited on the idea of preservation? And if the text, and, and honestly, which text is the preserved one? As Dr. White mentioned, there is no single TR. There's almost 30 editions of the TR. That is something I did not know. I had no clue. I assumed the Bluebound book was the final uh, work, and that was all of it. But no, there are numerous editions. They do not read identically. In fact, uh, almost a year ago, Jonathan Beasley and I, who's the lead pastor at uh, City Light in Seattle, we co-wrote an article called The Fallacy of a perfect Greek text. We had no idea the impact that that was going to have. We, we really wrote it for people who didn't understand the issue and were struggling with the area of preservation. Uh, our alma mater took great issue with it, challenged us back from the Greek uh, part of the uh, seminary or the, the, the school 
and, and actually responded to our article. And then we responded to it and they back to us again. It was two times uh, that we went back and forth. It was never intended to be what it was. And one of the things that most, almost all of those students or, or former graduates and alma mater at their alma mater had sent to us from different schools across the country was, we had no idea there was more than one addition to the TR. I was astonished in some ways, but then again, I wasn't because I was that guy 10 years ago. I had no clue. So when somebody says, which TR should I go to for the final complete preserved word? Now we finally, in the second response to uh, one of our former professors, I point blank asked him in the second article that we had responded to and said, which edition do I go to for the preserved word? And his answer was Scrivener got it right. Scrivener got it right. So if Scrivener got it right, we have to conclude that a man who did not agree with all of his own readings, as Dr. White pointed out, he was merely looking at the English translation of the King James. He's looking back. He, he knew the evidence is probably better than some of these others, but yet he was not looking to build a argument for himself in a textual position. He was looking to parallel a Greek text with an English translation. And I would even say, and I pointed this out, actually doing work through his appendix where he did the list, he actually got one section backward. And I pointed that out to the professor. He actually said that the King James went with one reading and they didn't. They actually went with the other. And the very last verse of the book of Revelation, Scrivener actually documented the wrong reading. So what do I do with that? Did God guide Scrivener to document the wrong reading in Revelation? So if he did, then we have to conclude a couple of things. One, Scrivener's 1800s, that no one in church history has had God's preserved word until after Scrivener. Or if you want to back it up and put it into the King James, 1611. The funny thing is, and I think this is the truth of the matter, on some of the readings we're going to look at tonight, had the King James translators gone with different readings, like in Luke 2, 22, like in Revelation 16, 5, I honestly believe these verses we're talking about tonight wouldn't even be on the table. Most of the discussion that we are having tonight is truly based on 1611, whether we want to believe that or not. The King James translators were tremendous scholars. I don't think myself or Dr. White would ever deny that, but we also recognize that they were working on limited access to me. They would have adored P46, P45. They would have loved to have access to many of the manuscripts that we have today. I'm not saying they had nothing, but they certainly did not have what we have at the fingertips on my phone that I can pull up from Germany and look at different manuscripts and zoom in on my phone and write a research paper on it for school. They probably would have done a better job with what we have today than we are because they were students, they were learning. And none of these editions, these guys believe that they had the end all of the Greek texts. That's why they had updates and they would have kept going if they were still alive. And so when I look at preservation, all that to say, I look at preservation, I think what we have to back up from is not look at a specific text because we're going to run into holes everywhere when we land on one because there are problems in every one of those texts. What we need to do is look at preservation from a bigger view than a single word. Now, I'm not saying God's not interested in every word. And I happen to believe that within the body of manuscripts, God in his divine wisdom and his divine sovereignty preserve for us the scripture. I just do not believe we can just pull out a book and go, it's right here. The closest thing we can get to it, in my opinion, is that the critical editions allow us to see the differences. For example, and I don't know where Dr. White is on this, in 2 Peter chapter number 3 in the Nesson on 28th edition, it is different than the Tyndale text. I happen to agree with the Tyndale text there. I, I happen to believe that Coptic manuscript shouldn't change it, but I, I'm also not smarter than everybody else that had the idea to change it. But my point is, is what, here's the difference. Regardless of my view on second Peter, I know the two readings because they're documented for me in the TR. You don't have that. The closest thing to that was 1707 in Mill's text. When he gave us almost a small apparatus showing us the variances that were there with the manuscripts he did. And I thought he did a tremendous job for what little bit he had. Uh, and his work has obviously impacted 
uh, some of our thinking of textual variances today. In fact, Dr. Bart Ehrman continues to go back to his text to come up with his number of variances as a whole using a percentage. So did God preserve his word? Yes. The question is, how did he preserve his word? If we're going to say things like the confessional position, that he kept it pure through all ages, I believe that if God promised to preserve his word, he's going to leave evidence to how he did it. And if I have to believe in a faith and faith approach where a guy didn't like a reading in his mind, I don't like the way this reads, or it doesn't make sense to my theological way of understanding, it must be wrong. I know there's no manuscript that tells me I'm wrong, but in my mind, it's wrong. And so I'm going to change it in the text. I'm going to conjecture my thought here. And then all of a sudden, now that's the reading that was kept through pure through all ages. I have a massive problem with that. And honestly, Bart Ehrman wins the argument. The Muslims win the argument when we take that kind of a defense. We need to be defending the defendable. <laughs> we have majored on the minor. We have minored on the major in this discussion. And as Dr. White said, there is no cardinal doctrine that is hinging on a single textual variant. They're affected, but is not hinging. In fact, Dr. Ehrman said that in the end of a debate with Dr. Wallace not long ago. He even agreed to that kind of a statement. And so what we need to learn to do is categorically look at this in the right approach, not allow ourselves to emotionally get charged into a tradition and navigate our decision off of a tradition, because let's be real, we're humans, we don't like change. And the fact of the matter is, is a lot of this is based in tradition, not in evidence. And what, what, what worked in my heart and the Lord used in my life was going back to the fact that God is a God that not only stands behind his word, but he proves himself. And if he promised that he was going to give us his word, then he's going to demonstrate to us how he did it in time and space. And I believe we have immense amount of opportunities to defend the scripture, even without these new readings that we're going to be talking about tonight. I think the word of God has been pre preserved for God's people. And even, let me say this real quick, even a man who never knew Greek, who was in the ancient world, who had it in the Egyptian languages of Coptic, of the Sahidic, or in Latin, they too had God's word. It may not be where it's perfect in every single place, but see, the thing is, is God's word was given to the Latin, those that spoke Latin who didn't know Greek. The word of God was given to those in Ethiopia who did not know Greek. God kept his word by giving it to his people. They were not without God's word. Most people that are watching this do not know Greek. They hold a copy of God's word in their hand. No, it's probably not perfect in every single place. I don't believe in a perfect translation but they have God's word and it is a reliable translation. You can trust your Bible, but we do have to talk about these issues. We have to talk about the variances. It's, it's just, we, the fact that we did not is why we are where we are right now. Thanks, uh, Stephen, for that. And uh, really, really uh, deep explanations into that. We already are getting a little bit of questions, but for those of you who are sending your questions, particularly also the, the, the super chat that we just received, we'll be addressing them in just a minute as we take uh, the first, text to just transition into the first text at the end of which if you do have questions i would encourage the live viewers uh, to you feel free to submit your questions but we are going to be taking questions based on uh, the verses that we cover we for example i do realize that uh, our team selecting the questions are passing the questions to me uh, we do already have a question from nick says concerning first john 5 7 we'll raise that up when uh, uh, we actually deal with first john 5 7 uh, well, uh, well, we're going to get into the, the text here. And also for those of you who submit a super chat, we will try to acknowledge that. Uh, we already do have one super chat from Jai. Uh, you're the first person ever in the history of Explain Apologetics. Not a very long history uh, to actually give a super chat. So thank you for that. But uh, we're going to go to Luke chapter 2, verse 22. And I also encourage those of you who want to submit questions, put the word Q in front of your questions so that our team can spot your question and actually do that and pick it up. Uh, and also please ask your questions relevant to Luke 2.22. So I'm going to go back to Dr. White. Um, Luke 2.22, just let me read it for those who are watching at home. Uh, reading from the ESV, it says, when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. But the King James says, now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Why did you choose this, uh, Dr. White, as, uh, for example, one of the texts that you want to talk about? And uh, how does this help us in, in the context of understanding whether the TR has been perfectly preserved? 
Well, the, the issue is, is fairly straightforward and it's, uh, uh, it has to do with the, the issue of purification. There is a textual variant in regards to the word outone. Um, and it's interesting when, when people look, even if they use the text, the, the modern critical text that we have, the modern critical text will not always list the variants with the TR, especially if in the opinion of the editors, there just isn't any possibility that the TR reading is original. And so it's not even listed uh, in the Nestellan text. And of course, the UBS fifth edition Greek New Testament, which a lot of beginning Greek students use in Bible colleges and seminaries, things like that, has a very limited textual critical apparatus in the sense of the number of variants that it examines. It's rather full when it does examine a variant, but uh, it's primarily meant for people who are doing translation of the languages. And so uh, you won't even see what the variant is unless you have the TR and you're, you're comparing the two, the two texts. Uh, but there are some manuscripts, specifically Codex Beze Canterbridgeans, it's called Codex D, and then some Latin, Syriac, and Sahidic manuscripts, just a few, uh, that have a different reading, uh, his purification, uh, rather than her purification in uh, their purification, I'm sorry, in, uh, in the Greek text. But the Textus Receptus has her purification. And this is clearly reflective of a concern and, and almost, almost any, any, the vast majority of, of textual variants where you have uh, in the gospels, a uh, what's called a cross corruption between the gospels. Very frequently, you can tell that a scribe was concerned about how a text might be understood, that it might be understood in a negative fashion. And so obviously you can see that if you, if you have um, their purification, then the concern is, well, are you saying that Jesus needed to be purified? Are you questioning uh, the, the purity of Jesus? And then later, once certain Marian dogmas begin to develop in the second and third centuries, you get the concern about Mary's uh, holiness and purity, uh, especially once you have it being proclaimed that Mary is, well, the Immaculate Conception wasn't proclaimed until 1854, but in the ancient church, there was a concept of her a special holiness. And so the issue here is, allows us to, I suppose we start with this one, allows us to raise this issue. What do we want to read in our Greek New Testament? Do we want to read the text that is the least susceptible to criticism? Or do we want to read the text that has the greatest claim to be what Luke actually wrote nearly 2,000 years ago. And I am committed, I have to be committed, to the conclusion that what we want to know is not what a scribe 500 years after the time of Jesus thought we should read or felt would be the most defensible reading, or 1,500 years after the time of Jesus, I want to know what Luke wrote. And so here you have a, the, here you have, and, and, and Stephen brought this up, and we're going to have to emphasize this more than once. Here is where the issue of consistency comes in. That is, as Stephen and I look at the manuscript evidence for Luke chapter two, there is a vast majority reading that includes all the different aspects of the manuscript tradition from the earliest manuscripts we have all the way through the tradition. The one exception is Codex D, and Codex D is very frequently an exception. Uh, Codex D I call the living Bible of the early church. <laughs> Okay, it was the weirdest, the, the author was not trying to provide a transcription, but more of a commentary and improvement. And so, for example, in Acts, when Peter is released, it gives you the exact number of stairs that he descends to get to the street. Okay, there's, there's some weird 
odd stuff, especially in Acts, in Codex D. So much so, it's called Beze Cantabrigensis because it was given to Beza. Stephanus had it. Beza didn't know Stephanus had it. Um, but uh, Beza, when he analyzed it, came to the conclusion uh, when, he, when he donated it to Cambridge University, which is why it's called Cantabrigensis, uh, in the letter that he sent along with it when he donated it, he said, uh, having studied this manuscript, it is better to be stored than to be read. Uh, better to put it in a drawer someplace uh, because it's just that unreliable. And so almost any reading, and keep this in mind when you talk about uh, the Pericope Adulterae, the story of the woman taking adultery, because the first manuscript we have it in, not references, but running text manuscript we have it in, happens to be Beze Cantabrigensis. Um, when you have a reading that appears first in D and doesn't have earlier manuscript evidence supporting it, that's almost automatically a 99% check that one off the list as not original. That's what you have uh, with the Al2 reading here. We're not even talking about the TR reading. We're not even talking about the TR reading. But here's the point. If you're going to defend this as original, then you're going to have to come up with a particular form of argumentation. If you take that form of argumentation and then bring it into all the other verses we're going to look at, whether it be the Kama Johannium or Revelation 16.5 or Acts 8.37, you're not going to use that form of argumentation now. You're going to use a completely different form of argumentation. So if for every single verse, you come up with a new method of textual criticism, I submit to you that that is the clearest evidence of the incoherence and error of the position that you have taken. And one of the reasons I emphasize this is I've seen this before. I see this every time I talk to a Mormon missionary and I bring up issues in the text of the Book of Mormon or changes in the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. And I provide them with, doc with documentation of the editing of the text over time. I see in their responses, they use different arguments because their ultimate authority is the final form of the text as it stands. Same thing with my Muslim friends and the Quran as well. They will use different arguments when I point out problems in different texts. We can't do that. Back in 2006, I debated Shabir Ali at Biola University, and I introduced a, a saying in that debate. It was original. It's not overly, it's not certainly original thought, but it was an original way of argumentation that has been repeated over and over again. Inconsistency is the mark of a failed argument. Inconsistency is the mark of a failed argument. And so when TR advocates use one form of argumentation for Luke 2.22, different one for, for Acts 8.37, different one for Revelation 16.5, different one for 1 John 5.7, they're proving that this is their final authority. Whatever argument you need to, do, to, to get to this, you can use it. You can contradict yourself 10,000 times as long as the result is this. Well, that's no different than me holding up a Quran or a Book of Mormon because they're using the same methodology. And if I'm going to point the finger and say, you can't do that with those, I've got to be consistent, even with people that I would consider to be my brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to be consistent in the argumentation we're using. Stephen, you want to add some more on the history of that text? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a fascinating text because like you just said, Dr. White, when we go through these passages, we, these are the very things that turn me away from the TR because you have no standard of assessment. It's like, okay, well, read the, it's the Byzantine text that God has preserved. That is the pure line of the scripture, even though no two Byzantine texts read identically, uh, but all the Byzantine texts that we have would support in a majority and a massive majority, a reading that is in the critical text here. This, this, it doesn't matter if you think, oh, well, you know, let's go into the other traditions. Let's go into the Byzantine or the Alexandrian. It really doesn't matter where you land on this one. You're going to end up with their purification. 
Uh, so this, so the question is then why is this even an argument? Again, let's defend the defendable, not defend a tradition. And Dr. White just said it. You, you have a text that cannot be wrong. So we have to make everything else fit and mold into making this one right. It doesn't matter the cost. It doesn't matter the evidence. We have to make it fit. I go back and I continue to contend for the fact that if the King James translation read there today, we wouldn't even be discussing this verse right now. I really do not. In fact, uh, it may be interesting to note that in the stage one committees, when they were looking at the 1604 Bishop's Bible, the translators were really, they were not creating a new translation in 1611, that, or well, they started before they finished in 1611. They were not starting a brand new work. In fact, they were updating the 1604 Bishop's and you actually can find pictures of this where they crossed out the Bishop's Bible that had the word her purification and they wrote above it there. And then on the side, the margin had a note that said, or uh, there, and they crossed it that and changed it to no, we want or her to be in the margin. Well, the first committee, the group that spent the most time in Luke's gospel doing the translating spent most of the time doing the work. There was another committee that came behind in stage three with Bancroft and Smith and others. And they did a quick edit of the whole Bible, Old and New Testament. And they had the power to go behind the committees and actually change it. Well, guess what they, do? they did? They disagreed with the committee on Luke's gospel, switched it back to the Bishop's Bible reading and put her. Uh, so this is an amazing concept. So when we talk about did the King James get it right? Did the TR get it right? We have a conflict. The King James translators didn't even agree with themselves on this reading. The original committee said, we do not, they intentionally disagreed with her enough to cross it out and write above it there. The final committee got the same, uh, got, got the final say so. So guess what? Theirs went through. So the King James has her, but really did the King James translators actually believe that was the reading depends which ones you're talking about because they didn't agree you go through the tr editions they don't all agree on this so again where am i going which tr edition do i go to and say they got it right they got it right there's conflict within itself it's not it's not defendable this reading is not defendable in fact um one of the competitions of desiderius erasmus when he was rushing to get his done was the competencian polyglot he was working against cardinal jimenez and, and the polyglot actually has uh, her here, or excuse me, uh, yeah, uh, has her here. And the funny thing is they left a marginal note as to why they went with that reading, which makes me think they didn't go off the Greek evidence because they used Leviticus as their argument. They put a note about Leviticus in the margin indicating they were making a theological choice, not a textual choice. It's possible they were, I don't want to make an assertion that's a, a complete assumption, but it seems like if you're going to make an argument to defend this reading, you're going to list whatever documents you have in front of you to prove why you're doing it. When all of the manuscripts that they had up to that point that we know of had there, but again, in their mind, this is not theologically correct in their mind. So we have to defend a proper exegesis. And so especially Cardinal Jimenez, uh, who's working with the Catholic church and working with the evidences that they're giving you can't, we can't do that. You know, they can't have that in their system. So they're trying to go off of a system change, not so much off of the evidence. So they leave a marginal note. Where do they send you to for the evidence? Leviticus, not the manuscripts. The question is, what did Luke write? What did Luke write? Way, Dr. White? Yeah, by the way, I, I was just in passing what Stephen just said, I, I point something out. He said, he, he mentioned, we don't know of any manuscripts that they had access to that had X, Y reading. But what I do encounter are TR only advocates who will say, yeah, we may not know today about any manuscripts that support this reading, but maybe they had them and they've been lost. Um, and again, I'm, I'm used to this mindset because I've encountered it in other religious faiths in defense of their text saying, yeah, I can't really substantiate it, but maybe, who knows? This is not the kind of standard that you can take into a debate with Bart Ehrman. This is not the kind of a standard that we should be utilizing because we don't have to. Um, 
if any of you have ever seen when I debated Bart Ehrman in 2009, uh, I asked him a question based upon something he had, he had said. And he went off and said something I didn't expect, but I'm awful glad that he did. I was talking about the time period between when the New Testament documents were written and our first manuscript copies. And he made the statement, for the New Testament, we have much earlier manuscript attestation than for any other work of antiquity. I almost fell out of my chair. I was so thankful that he had, because he rarely says grossly wrong things on a factual level. It's his conclusions that are the problem, not, not his facts. And so for him to make that application, I thought was extremely important. But what does that demonstrate? We don't need to be invoking mythological manuscripts that no one knows existed. Yes. To, to go that direction is to go the exact opposite direction of the great gift of this massive manuscript tradition that God has preserved for us, even through the destructive period with the Roman Empire between 250 and 313 is doing its best to wipe this thing out. Yet God has preserved so much for us over all of these centuries. Uh, to go the, to to destroy that and go the other direction and start invoking mythological manuscripts that no one has anymore uh, is a real problem. Well, thank you guys for that. Uh, so we, we, we've covered uh, Luke chapter two, verse twenty-two, and now I do want to uh, go to the questions that uh, we've received. Shout out to Sam Shamoon uh, and also uh, Robert Trulove, Nick Sayers, and the rest who are in the live chat. Uh, very lively in the live chat indeed. Uh, and uh, we do have one super chat. I'm uh, just going to raise to Dr. White. It's up to him what he wants to do about it. Uh, it's from Jai, as I mentioned earlier. He says, can Dr. James White please give a shout out to my best friend, Ariel Gonzalez. He's an up and coming apologist. And we both love and appreciate Dr. James White's work. Thanks and God bless. Well, great. I, I, I'm not sure of all the names, but uh, I'm very thankful that they're listening and finding it to be a useful, useful conversation. And uh, we need up and comers. I just hate to tell you something. Um, I think if you're an up, up and coming apologist right now, you're going to be facing a considerably different context and situation than I did during most of my life. I've had, I've had all the freedom in the world to engage in debates and travel the world and do things like that. I'm not sure you're going to be in the same situation. So as I say to everyone going into apologetics and they come up to me after a debate or something like that, um, I say, if you can do anything else and obey God, do it. If you're going to do apologetics, it needs to be a fire in your bones. Uh, it needs to be something that you have to do because God has absolutely called you and gifted you to do it. You can't do anything else and still be obedient. So yeah, it's not how to get a lot of apologists going, but I think it's important. Well, thanks for that. Now, I'm going to uh, leave, put the question, address it to any one of you, uh, because these questions were not specific, but uh, Bo Kikopt, uh, I, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, says, what is the earliest text for Luke 2.22, uh, why they cannot accept it if it's the earliest? So, so I'm not sure what you make of that. Any one of you, feel free to go ahead. Well, I, I assume the question is being asked, what is the earliest attested reading for Luke 2.22? And it's, it's, it's out tone there. Um, that's what you're going to have in the, the earliest codices uh, from the fourth century. I am not, I'd have to check real quick to see if there is a, uh, because like I said, because they don't uh, show variations that they don't consider to be meaningful um i don't it doesn't give the full the full listing uh but if there are any papyri that contain luke chapter two they would also read alton as well that's the way that the messiolan apparatus would list that yeah some some of the manuscripts have uh, like dr white mentioned his there like codex d some skip it don't even have uh, one there in fact i think the niv doesn't even put the pronoun there if I'm not mistaken, I think the NIV absolutely doesn't even put her or there. Uh, I'd have to double check that, but That's if, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the 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 point is is that there isn't a manuscript tradition you can go to to find any other reading. You can go to pretty much any century and find uh, the reading should be uh, there. Thanks for that. We're going to go to the next question from uh, Robert Trulove, who asks. What did Luke write? How do we discern that? Do you have Luke's original? 
I, I suspect that's a rhetorical question. Um, and uh, does God establish that or does men? Well, that's the question we should be asking the other way around. Well, who gave the rights to change what all the manuscripts had said? Again, there is a standard. Even the TR editors use a standard. And I know Robert Trulove knows that. The question is, is who gave Beza and these others a right to change something they had no evidence for? They did it off of theological assertions. Uh, none of us have the original autographs, but if we believe God has preserved his word, he's going to leave elements of evidence to his preservation. And this one is overwhelmingly abundant, pointing to the word there. It is the one person who decided it does not fit a criteria of understanding on a theological term, changing it to fit, similar to what Cardinal Jimenez did in the polyglot. It doesn't make sense to me, so it can't be right. Is that the method of preservation that we want? I would say to uh, Brother True Love, we don't have the original, but we have a lot of evidence that points to the fact that we should reject this reading and even other TR editions should, uh, as they did, not have this reading. And even, I should say, I agree with the first group of the King James translators who said, no, not this reading. Dr. White, would you like to add to that? Well, I, I just simply have to point out that the very form of the question assumes that what you have here, which did not exist before Scrivener, is the original. And therefore, the early church didn't have it. Uh, somehow they got the deity of Christ right at the Council of Nicaea without having the right text. Uh, somehow they, they managed to do all the Christological stuff at the Council of Chalcedon, the hypostatic union, without having the right text. Uh, this, this is an amazing, uh, amazing assertion to make. It, it is what is being said, however, by TR advocates, is they're literally making the result of Erasmus. And if you've read Erasmus when he was commenting on, on texts, he would very often include a reading in his text, which is now in the TR, that he would go, well, it might be this, it might be that, I leave it to the reader. <laughs> and, that, and that then becomes solidified in stone in the Texas Receptus. Um, I think we need to take a much closer look at the history of the church and recognize that if it was important, if it was so important for God to do some kind of super spiritual uh, providential something in the 16th century, the church in the 4th century was just as important as the church in the 16th. And that's not what you get out of the, the TR-only position. Well, thanks. So one last question, uh, or, or rather comment on this before we move on. We do have, uh, the reason we have to move on is there's a lot of time. And we, if, do, we, if we do have extra time, uh, my apologies, uh, we, we'll come back to some of these questions. But the next one is uh, from Nick Sayers uh, before we move on. Uh, Nick Sayers made a couple of points. Uh, he says- no, uh, Really? More than one point? I can't believe Nick would do that. <laughs> well, uh, Nick says, uh, well, uh, I'm trying to pull it up here because we kind of uh, missed that. So uh, I believe he quoted Augustine. Uh, do apologize, Nick. I'm trying to find that comment here. Well, he says Jerome in 383 AD against Helvidius, uh, which is also in the perpetual virginity of Mary section 12, which has, and I quote, at all the events, uh, oh, sorry, uh, at all the events, scripture speaks of the Savior in quotation marks, and when the days of a purification. Uh, he also says that Augustine in Harmony of the Gospels, Book 2, Chapter 5, has when the days of her, referring to his mother, uh, purification. So does that somehow add weight to the, refer the, 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 the reading uh, that um, it refers to Mary and not to Jesus? Two yeah, what you Oh, sorry, what, what you end up having the TR folks doing is they find the patristic sources to be a playground. So what you can do is um, if, and, and, and again, here, and, and I, I thought Stephen's debate with uh, Nick was very, very good. I'd recommend uh, people, it was on Revelation 16.5. Uh, I'd re recommend that people uh, take time to listen to that and, and uh, follow it very, very carefully. But here's, here's the thing. When Augustine agrees with you, you quote him. When Augustine disagrees with you, you don't quote him. There's no consistency, absolutely no consistency. And over the years, as I've interacted with, with Nick's materials, the most consistent thing I can say is he's never consistent. 
So he will use whatever argument on whatever text because this is his final authority. And therefore, if I can find something in Augustine, now the, the, the fact of the matter is, was that, a, was that transmitted through Latin? Was that transmitted through Greek? Uh, certain for Augustine, it would almost always be Latin, but what was the transmission? When, what, what is the uh, textual history of even the copies of Augustine's writings? Where did that come from? I've always pointed out that when you quote from patristic sources, very often you're not quoting from a critical edition of the patristic sources. There are variants amongst the manuscripts of the early writers themselves. So that's why manuscripts are the most important foundational reality for determining original readings. Because when you start getting into an early church father, was he quoting? That's what Stephen's working on right now when he's looking at, uh, at apostolic fathers. Did they, were they quoting from a written text? Were they doing what most preachers do today and paraphrasing or quoting from memory or whatever else, or whatever else it might be? We don't know. When you have an actual manuscript that is meant to be being copied as a manuscript, that's when you have an actual transmission of the text rather than someone who's quoting off memory or something like that and if they're emphasizing something about Mary, they might say her, or, or may even think that it says her. This is the problem that I see in going to patristic sources inconsistently. Uh, that's, the, that's the real issue there. Stephen? Yeah, I would, I would jump in, and you're right on, Dr. White, because <clears throat> even when looking at Codex H, which is a very difficult manuscript to read, that guy uh, had the gift of abbreviating everything, uh, he when you look at first Clement, for example, and the other witnesses of first Clement we have, there are variances of first Clement. Uh, he'll quote a verse a certain way. And it's funny because in some lines it is Byzantine styled reading. It would be closer to a Byzantine text, but then you go to the other one, all of a sudden he's agreeing with a papyri in one spot different from there. So keep in mind, even when a scribe, because we don't have the original, just like the originals of the new Testament, we don't have the originals of Augustine. We don't have the originals of Jerome. So when you look at this, you will find this tendency. If you are looking at a church father who is in the 13th century, you are, or excuse me, whose who's, uh, copy is a 13th century copy of Clement or somebody like that, you'll notice the quotations are very close to the 13th century New Testaments that we have in our manuscript tradition. So it's interesting how they really harmonize and parallel because uh, a lot of times these guys were just going through with what they had. And one of the things, Samuel, I've been on your show before. You remember me doing this with a different document with Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians. Yes. If you remember, I showed the different charts. I have four sections where it appears that they are directly quoting a, pa a passage, which seems like he's copying a manuscript, an indirect citation, which is literally giving a paraphrase summary of it or a partial, just little phrase. And then there was a fourth category where it's just not sure if he's even quoting scripture at all. And I tried to categorically place all the citations. Most of the fathers appear, and I'm going to be careful with my words, appear to be quoting from memory, except in longer portions. And they are very close to the Septuagint when they are quoting, very close, especially in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it, it's very interesting to see the different dynamics based on which copy of first Clement you're reading. So again, we have to keep that in mind. Number two, uh, as much as Beza and his mind and others were trying to protect a misconception about the purification, why should we believe he was the first one that came up with that idea? It is a natural response for us to see, whoa, whoa, why does Jesus need purification too? He's, he's the sinless, perfect son of God. I don't believe that the uh, you know, the, the end of the 1500s was the first time somebody came up with the idea, hey, that looks bad in our text. Uh, and again, how are they quoting it? Were they quoting it from the perspective of they're trying to emphasize something in the text and in doing so, they're going to place the emphasis on Mary over Jesus? Because if you read the story very carefully, the point of the passage is actually based on Mary. That whole chapter is focusing on Mary. In fact, she was given quite the narrative in an audience to the reader about her life and her, her understanding that there's going to be a, a piercing in her own soul for what was going to happen. The focus is on Mary. So if somebody's giving a summary of that section, they're going to naturally land on Mary as the main character to be emphasized. 
we, we have to look at not just what are they quoting, how are they quoting? It shows up all the time in my dissertation work, all the time. Dr. White, you wanted to add something? I, I was going to, but we, we've still got a bunch of stuff to get to. Um, yeah, so uh, I, the only thing I was going to say is this. Uh, when, someone, when someone says, well, look, um, Augustine had such and such a, such a reading here. What I want to point out to people is it doesn't actually matter to the TR only position what Augustine said. Because if Augustine had, if, if Augustine consistently, and by the way, when you look at textual critical information, you'll very frequently see Augustine four slash eight, which means four out of the eight times that Augustine quotes this, he quotes it this way and then four the other way. So it's, it's a split decision type of a situation. But the point is, all of this textual critical stuff that is being presented is irrelevant to the TR only position. It doesn't matter. I don't even know why they bring it up. Because if Augustine said theirs, they just ignore it. It wouldn't matter. It only matters when it supports their position. So why even bring it up? Because if, if, if you couldn't find a single early church father, look at Ephesians 3.9. The, it, it's unknown in the early church, the TR reading. It's just completely unknown. No one had ever seen it before, but it doesn't matter. So I can go to Ephesians 3.9 and say, hey, supports the critical text versus the TR. Doesn't matter. But then you go to here, well, Augustine might have had this over here. That's not, a, that's not consistency. Um, that, that has to be rejected. All the textual discussion in the world is actually irrelevant to TR onlyism when you, when you boil it all down, because as one of the questions asked, well, is this what God does or what man does? So in their mind, God did this. Don't worry about Erasmus. Don't worry about Beza. Don't worry about Stephanus. Don't worry about the, what they said and the reasoning they used, which is man doing textual criticism. God did this. That's the final, that's the final assertion. And that's what we go with. There you go. And that's, Anyway, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So sorry about that. Yeah, we, we've got to move on. But this question came up about three times already. So just in passing, if someone could respond to it in about 30 seconds or so, if it's possible. Uh, it's, it's from Robert Trulove, uh, who says, I would ask of these men, is the text of the Reformation sufficient or is it not? If you could just give a brief reply and we move straight to the second text. Sufficient for doctrine? Yes. Sufficient for being the final say-so on every single reading on every single page? No. They did not have the wealth of information that we have today. They would have utilized the information we have today. They just did not have it. Right. They would have utilized what we have today. There is no question about that. And I would simply challenge the whole idea of a singular text of the Reformation because there wasn't a singular text of the Reformation. There was a general uh, 11th to 14th century primarily Byzantine manuscript tradition text that was used in general. But if you really want the text of the Reformation, let's be honest, it was the Latin Vulgate. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, they, mo most of the reformers were significantly better in Latin. They, they spoke and preached and everything else in Latin than they were in Greek. Yep. So if you want to go with the text of the Reformation, you might want to go with the Latin Vulgate uh, for, for all that matters. And that's evidenced by their annotations. They left their notes in Latin. They obviously, oh, yeah. and in fact, Erasmus's main purpose was to prove he could do a better job than Jerome. His emphasis was not the Greek side. No, he did a no. diglot to show that he could actually use the original language being a humanist, which doesn't mean what we use it as today, that, that the Latin was actually supported by the Greek as if Jerome's wasn't. But he was making the statement that he could do a better job than Jerome. His goal was to emphasize the new Latin translation. Yeah, and I think, I think Erasmus personally was probably a little miffed that he had to spend so much time defending his Greek choices later on and that the field of battle moved to that and sort of yes. eclipsed his Latin translation. I think mm -hmm. he was really ups upset about that because it's very clear his emphasis was upon the Latin, not upon the Greek. Yes. Well, we, we do have to move on. Thank you guys for, for responding and thank you for those of you in the uh, live chat as well. We're going to Acts 8.37 and we are trying to cover this a little bit quicker than we did the last one. Uh, in the King James Bible, <laughs> in the King James Bible, uh, it says, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. 
Um, I don't have the ESV with me here. So <laughs> um, could, you, could you explain to us why this is relevant in the context of this discussion? Yeah, it's missing in the ESV. You won't find it. <laughs> so there's nothing to read in the ESV. It actually skips over the verse. This is an amazing verse because uh, when I, I struggled with this one, regardless of the evidence, because it's like, wow, there's no profession. He's just baptismal regeneration. Of course, that's the way I was taught. But if you actually read the text carefully, he was convinced of the truth when the scriptures were brought to him out of Isaiah. That was the conviction of change and salvation. We don't have to have that. Now, I will say this, and I don't know where Dr. White is in this. I think it is absolutely possible that this verse is traditionally true. Not did Luke write it, but traditionally. It's possible. I'm not saying it is. But the question that we're asking is, did Luke write that? Uh, the, the evidence is overwhelmingly against it as well. There's just over 60 manuscripts that have this, that cover the book of Acts. And there are 12 different forms of this verse. Now think about that. Out of just about 60 to 64 manuscripts, most of them are much, much later. They aren't even on the same page on how to tell this one little story. There's 12 different basic forms with a variety of minor variations in the text between these witnesses. In fact, there are 22 distinct forms in total. And the one that the Texas Receptus, the blue bound that uh, Dr. White's been holding up, follows minuscule 1883, which guess what, guess what century that manuscript is? Yeah, it's 16th century. So what we have, again, if every word is important, as we just learned from there and her, if, if Pronouns like that can be important. We're dealing with many, many, many more variances right here. There are 22 distinct forms in this reading. And the one that is in the blue bound TR today, that is the final determined word of God for the people of God, so to speak, is from a minuscule manuscript of 1883. And it reads just like that one. And it is 16th century. That's problematic, very problematic. And the question is, is why is it that in just 60 or so manuscripts, we have so many variances within itself. These manuscripts can't even get on the same page. Those are major red flags that you have to wave when you're studying manuscripts. It's like, okay, it's obvious the scribes were trying to force a tradition. And again, I am willing to be totally wrong about this. Force a known tradition, maybe oral, passed down into the text to fill it out. We see the same thing happen in John chapter five, verse four, when they're at the pool, talking about the angel. It was probably a tradition that was held early on by the Jewish people. The question is, did John write it? I think we're dealing with a similar situation here in Acts chapter eight. It's possible there was a known tradition of this proclamation and that they were trying to fit it into the text. And the variations that we have of it seem to point to the fact that many scribes knew of it, but didn't know how to word it and get on the same page. I think it's important just to give a little bit of the data. Uh, and what's really interesting, because this hits with, we were talking about the uh, doctoral work that I'm doing on P45. P45 and P74 are two of the key early papyri in the book of Acts. Um, and they both do not contain uh, this particular text. And so this is your earliest text together with Sinaiticus, Alexandrus, Vaticanus, C., uh, and then numerous other translations from the early period, the Syriac, the Coptic, Ethiopic. Uh, so the, the question becomes when there is, when you have a text that is not found in the most primitive manuscripts that we possess, and then as Stephen brought out, very important telltale sign is that you have this whole cluster of variants when it does begin to appear. And that's, you have the same, this is in a number of the texts we can look at, it's the same thing. Where you have a disruption in the text, you end up with all these variants because it's not been transmitted throughout the manuscript tradition. When you put those two things together, then uh, you know, this, this is coming primarily, again, from, from the Latin tradition into the Greek. Um, because the Latin has, in the West especially, uh, become the primary theological text of language and practice. And that's what you're going to find memorized and used in the church and, and everything else. And we're, we've moved far away from that, somewhat to our detriment, to be honest with you. Almost nobody today does Latin very well. Uh, but 
for us, therefore, it, it becomes more difficult to even begin to understand uh, why this was would have the uh, ability to enter into the text the way that it did. But again, the issue is, why doesn't P45 have it? Why doesn't P74 have it? Those are two manuscripts that are related to one another, but separated by hundreds of years. Uh, is this some sort, sort of editing? What's, what's going on here? Uh, why do the earliest forms of the text not, not contain these readings? And then why are there so many variants when it does finally appear? Try to be fast on that one. <laughs> Well, uh, really appreciate it. Do you, do you want to add anything else, Stephen, before we go straight to the questions? Well, I'll just go on to say that again, when we're looking at this passage, the majority text would almost eliminate this as well. And in fact, one of the things that I found amazing is when I was growing up, Dean Bergon was the standard of the guy that you read on textual variances. And then I finally realized when I was in college, he rejected this passage. And it's like, oh, wait, hey, the guy I've been referenced to uh, Dean Bergon says it doesn't belong. And then it's like, whoa, 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 don't bless what God, you know, don't, don't question what God has blessed for 400 years. And then it's right back to the tradition, faith and faith. And it's like, well, I thought I was supposed to read Dean Bergon because you gotta understand I became majority text after I left the TR. I didn't go straight to a critical text position. That was part of the progress. The first thing I did, one of these verses, Dean Bergon convinced me that this one was not authentic. And so we, we have to remember uh, even guys in that camp do not accept this. This is not a Byzantine priority, much less an early attestation. It is not even a Byzantine priority to give. And the, and the reason is that the Byzantines that do contain it, again, they do not agree with each other. And we have to accept that a 16th century manuscript was the very source that preserved the perfect wording to this verse, 16th century. And then we're supposed to believe that this was kept pure through all ages, we can't demonstrate how, we just believe by faith, in faith, that God did it. We don't know how, because they don't agree, and then it's missing in the earliest attestations, but this 16th century manuscript got it right, the TR copied it, boom, settled, God's preserved his word. Now, go take that and debate Bart Ehrman. Now, go take that and debate the Muslims. It's like, no way, man, I'm not going into just, battle with that. Just, just, just remember that Dean Burgon could never have been a member of the Dean Bergon Society. <laughs> that says everything that you need to know uh, about uh, the modern uh, King James only and TR only movements as far as Dean Bergon is concerned, is he could never yes. have been a member of the society that's named after him uh, because he didn't take the positions that are, are attributed to him today. Well, thank you guys for that. Thank you for being brief on Acts 837. And the reason I say that is because I know the big one is coming right after this, First John 5, 7. Um, we, we, we may even have Muslim by choice here. You never know. Uh, but uh, what I'll say is that, <laughs> uh, well, uh, what, what, what uh, an important question came up by, um, let me see, uh, I just got it off here by uh, Nick Sayers again. I am trying to find it. Uh, Is there a limit on questions? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, there is none. Uh, we do encourage those of you in the live chat to continue sending your questions. And thanks, Nick, for this one. And also Robert Rula as well. Uh, well, Nick says, Philip declared, and he's citing in quotation marks, Philip declared that this was Jesus. Also, the believing eunuch himself uh, requesting to be baptized. He said, I believe Jesus Christ to be the son of God close quotation marks. This is from Irenaeus, um, AD 115 to 202 in uh, Against Heresies 312. Uh, yeah. Response, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So let me say this, and Dr. White, you can come in behind me. Cyprian and Irenaeus do quote this. Now, one of the things that we, we are, we don't need to repeat what we just said about the fathers because we will just kill some time. But here's the thing that I would ask Nick. Go back a few chapters into Acts chapter 4, verse 12 where Irenaeus and Cyprian both agree with each other on another reading where it talks about there shall be uh, under no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. They both omit the first clause for there shall be no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Both of them lack that first clause in agreement. So if Irenaeus and Cyprian become the main source to defend this reading, then we have to reject the first clause a couple chapters earlier in Acts 4.12. Again, 
the fathers are not the start. And we just gave all of the reasons why, whether it's transmission, whether it's using uh, text to harmonize that are in that day. But again, can you be consistent with that, Nick? I appreciate the question. I do recognize that Irenaeus, Cyprian, and guys like that do mention this, but they reject sorry, the just first to interject, Chromatius as well, I think he brought up uh, fourth century. Yeah. Again, so, but again, if these guys are the standard, then we cannot have the phrase, for there is none other name among heaven given among men where we might be saved. That we got to get rid of it. Cyprian and Irenaeus did not quote it together in their Latin text. Therefore, it should not belong. If we're going to be consistent, this is what Dr. White has been emphasizing. Can we be consistent with the rules that we're throwing out here? If so, if, if Nick is willing to reject Acts 8, 4, 12 in the first clause, we can have a more thorough discussion about this. But again, they're not the standard, in my opinion. Dr. White? Simple question. If Irenaeus has Luke 2.22 and says they, will Nick accept it? Answer, no. Therefore, this is irrelevant. Again, none of the textual issues, none of the fathers, none of this is actually relevant because the ultimate standard is simply the TR. You, 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 don't, you don't have any other way of dealing with this. And so when we look at 1 John 5, 7 in a second, and then we ask about Irenaeus or we ask about Augustine, you're not going to have the same standard. So there's, there's no way to have a textual discussion with someone who has already said, this is it. Whatever supports this is true. Whatever goes against this is false. There's no reasoning with someone in that situation. You can't. It's just not possible. Um, and every time a question comes up, it only proves it. It only demonstrates it over and over and over again. That's, that's somewhat of a, it's, it's frustrating. Uh, it doesn't make me mad. It makes me very concerned uh, because I've, again, seen this attitude in many other places in defense of many other texts, uh, whether that's the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses, the Quran, the Book of Mormon. I've seen this dogged, if I just won't even reason with you, I will dig up fact after fact after fact, but I'll never connect them together, and I will never accept that I am under responsibility to be consistent in how I use these things. It's a problem. It's a real problem. Well, well thank you. We do have a couple of super chats uh, and a and maybe one or two more questions before we go to First uh, John five seven. I you said you had uh, never gotten super chats before. Uh, yeah, this is the second one. So uh, the well, first one was the and, one and the shout making, out. We're so. making you really, we're making you really popular, aren't we? Oh, <laughs> you're making me rich by twenty dollars. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> and I do appreciate that. <laughs> by the way, all the all the all the uh, whatever we do get from the super chats goes to explain apologetics ministry, which is based in Malaysia, uh, to fund our staff that are back there. So thank you and really appreciate your support. The question is unrelated uh, to what you guys said, but if you could just respond to this real quick, Joel Z says, "What book of books would be good to begin with when wanting to study these topics?" Oh, goodness. Um, well, uh, Stephen read one that he liked, but I don't know if I can actually recommend that one. Uh, that would be self-promotional. Um, uh, <laughs> I've, I've actually, no. uh, I've, yeah, there you go. I've actually said recently, uh, and I, I, I don't have time to develop this, but I've actually said recently that almost anything being that is in print right now um, is outdated. And here's why. Uh, everything that's in print right now is based upon basically 1970s to 1990s terminology, uh, which includes using terminology like Byzantine, Alexandrian, Western, Caesarean, etc., etc. All of that is changing in light of what is going on in Munster and the utilization of CBGM and issues related to that. There's going to be a major re- phrasing of the arguments uh, that's going to be coming up. And so keep in mind, if you buy Metzger, if you buy Oland, if you buy the, the standard works on textual criticism, uh, they're all from the 90s. And so there's going to be some, some major revision going on, even though the actual number of changes that have resulted from the application of CBGM technology and Acts and the general epistles, very, very small very, very small number of, and in fact, the vast majority of them, you wouldn't even notice if you were reading the text if you didn't know what they were. Um, so, but that is going to uh, 
result in a rephrasing of a lot of the argumentation and discussion, including my own book. Uh, there's, there's no question about it. Yeah, I think <clears throat> this book is more towards an apologetics purpose, but uh, my friend Elijah Hickson and uh, right. Peter Gurry wrote a book called The Myths and Mistakes of New Testament Textual Criticism. I know Dr. White knows uh, Dr. Gurry. Uh, I've interviewed Dr. Gurry and Dr. Mead and Timothy Mitchell and all these guys. They've actually come on for City Light and, and have done some discussions on textual criticism, both Old and New Testament. And uh, it's geared towards apologetics, but uh, it might not be the first book you start with, but it would be a great one because it, one, it's updated. Uh, two, it calls out a lot of fallacies that are used in argumentation when defending the scripture. And, and it really helps us fine tune how we word things and how we allow uh, ourselves not to be so dogmatic about things that we don't have enough evidence of yet, but we give a, a wording that would allow us to be wrong 10 years from now when new discovery comes. So they did a great job with that. A bunch of guys got together and co-wrote this. Um, this would be a good one I would recommend off the top of my head. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, and we go to, uh, we do have a, another super chat by Bill, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, Sutton, who says, Dr. White, how will we know uh, we have gotten back to what the apostles wrote if we don't have the originals? Well, that's the whole issue is uh, there are no originals from that time period. And, and so to, to ask that they be uh, maintained, and then if you don't have them, then we can't know, is to mean we can't know anything historically. Do we, do we, have, the Ten, do we have the original plates of the Ten Commandments? Do we have Moses' writings? Uh, Isaiah, perhaps? And yet Jesus quotes from Isaiah. He quotes from the prophets. And so it seems like some people have a standard that even Jesus and the apostles didn't have. That's going a little bit beyond uh, what, uh, that, that's entering into hyper-skepticism. So Jesus could have confidence that God had preserved his word over a lengthy period of time in his assertions in talking to the Jews. And we can have the same confidence that God is engaged in the same ex extension of energy in the preservation of his word today. The question is, how has he done so? Has he done so in one singular text from the 16th century, or did he do so in the manuscript tr tradition that represents the building of the church all through history itself? I'm sort of a little worried, and I don't want to get off into this area, but I'm a little worried that sometimes we approach this subject from a very, very conservative, fundamentalist Protestant background that does not appreciate the reality of the fact that God has been building his church for 2,000 years. Um, I've taught church history for years, and so I'm well aware of the fact that God's people needed his word all through history in dealing with all sorts of difficult issues. And if you recognize that, then you recognize that God has preserved that word in the manuscript tradition as a whole, not in some kind of Joseph Smith translation, re-inspiration after years of corruption type of a concept, which is very common, but has no meaningful historical foundation to it. Well, thanks Dr. White for that. Sahi Luke, last question on this one before we move to the next one. Uh, Sahi Luke says, in light of the variant in Acts 8.37, would you say fundamental doctrine is not affected? Any one of you? Oh, no, yeah. surely not. I mean, uh, I mean, it's nice to have a basic statement like that, but are, are, is anyone really going to suggest that believing the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is not something that's repeated over and over and over and over again in 47 different contexts elsewhere? Uh, no, it, it does not impact the, the doctrinal teaching of the New Testament at all. Yeah, ex the, the statement that was made to me growing up is if we do not have that verse, we have baptismal regeneration. The, that is looking at the passage just with those two verses. It's not examining the whole text. Up to this point, Philip stopped him and spoke about what the prophet said in Isaiah, and he opened his mouth beginning with this scripture, told him the good news of Jesus. So where is conversion? Yes, a confession is a result of that. A conversion takes place in the heart. He was convinced about 
Jesus Christ being the one whom the prophet spoke of from the text, his salvation was being convinced of the truth by the text he was reading. And so what presented him from being baptized? Well, it wasn't salvation. It was getting out of the chariot and getting baptized. He was already saved by the point he got out of that chariot because the decision of the heart had already been convinced of the truth of the text. So if you read it without the presupposition of verse 37 belonging there, anybody who would have read that would have said, wow, he was convinced from the scripture and he looked at water knowing of baptism and says, what stops me from being baptized? <laughs> Nothing. Get out of the chariot. Let's go. Uh, so I, I don't think any doctrine is hinging there because salvation came from being convinced of Jesus Christ from the text, specifically in this one, a beautiful text, the text of the Old Testament scriptures in Isaiah. All right. Dr. White, do you want to say anything before we move on? Okay. We're going to move on now to 1 John 5, 7. This is the big one. Um, uh, it's the Koma Yohanya, right? and uh, it basically, uh, I've, I've cited this many, many times. I'm going to try and cite it from memory if I can. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Spirit, and these three are one. Uh, I've, I mean, I remember uh, dialoguing with a Muslim, and this was one of the first passages that was brought up. Uh, and said that your Bible is corrupted because, you know, this was added in later on. So uh, now I'm, my, my question to either one of you on this topic is, could you explain to us what is the controversy for someone who doesn't know? What is the controversy regarding this verse? And uh, how does that affect the doctrine of, or, or the understanding that the TR is the perfectly preserved uh, text? You want to go, Stephen? You want me to take first shot at it? Go ahead, Dr. White. Okay, fundamentally, um, the and it's interesting um you didn't quote it correctly don't feel badly there this is another one of those situations where when you do look at the very very few late manuscripts 14th century onward that actually have anything like this in it in the actual text they have variants too i've, I've i examined codex monfortianus in the reading room uh at Tr trinity college in dublin uh which was the primary manuscript that caused Erasmus to insert this into his third edition of the, of the TR. And it didn't read the same as what's in the, the Scrivener uh, TR today. I, I hand transcribed it and six months later, the whole thing came out in PDF online, which is sort of a bummer. But anyway, but hey, anytime you get to go to the, the Trinity reading room in Dublin is worth whatever it is you, you do. But the point is, you said Father, Son, and Spirit. It's Holy Spirit. You skipped over Holy. Uh, what if, what if you were an early church father? Let's <laughs> see, see what happens, uh, when you go, when you go by memory, um, uh, here's, here's, here's the point. Um, no one in the early church, think, think of the early church, think of the controversy of the early church. No one in the early church knew this text. Uh, I know some people say Cyprian, we'll, we'll, we can get into that if you want to. Even people who support the Byzantine manuscript tradition will tell you. The evidence is clear and plain. This arose 6th, 7th century Latin. It's what's called a gloss. It's an explanation of what the text is talking about when it talks the spirit and the water and the blood. This is a Latin gloss that becomes predominant in the later Latin manuscripts. Then you start seeing it appearing in the margins of Greek texts and later Greek texts that are maybe diglots and things like that to match the Latin that is, that is already there. It is not a part of the Greek manuscript tradition. Therefore, before we go into anything else, you need to understand that I have had people look me directly in the eye and tell me I was going to hell because I had a Bible in my hand that did not have 1 John 5, 7 from the King James Version of the Bible. Others, because I have said this is not original, clearly I am a child of Satan. Okay, so people have made this an absolute test of orthodoxy. But here's what you need to hear. If this was original, then we have no reason to believe in the tenacity and ancient text worthiness of the Greek manuscript tradition. If an entire verse that could have deep theological significance 
can disappear in toto from the Greek manuscript tradition for 1500 years and only have to be reinserted from a foreign language translation, then we have no reason to be defending the tenacity of the Greek manuscript tradition. Now, I realize that TR defenders are not trying to say that purposefully, but it is what they are saying. And this to me is extremely important because this is the foundation of the defense of the transmission of the text down through the centuries. And so Bergon, you, you name them, the, 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 the scholars who understood what these issues were about, they're not gonna stand there and tell you that you're going to hell if you don't, if you don't uh, hold on to this particular perspective and things like that. They recognize these issues. But once you elevate this, to the status of the original, once you make this in essence, whether you want to admit that you're doing it or not, because there's no Greek manuscript anywhere in the world that reads identical to this, nowhere. Once you make this your final standard, you have ended any possibility of defending the historicity of the text over against any other religious group that claims historicity for their text over time. You can't engage in a criticism of the Quran if you hold to 1 John 5, 7 being original. You can't do it. You're being a hypocrite if you do it. I can't do it. I think that's why it's important to point this out. Over to you, Stephen. Yeah, I think it should be noted as well that this is, um, it's typically believed the TR advocates are trying to defend the Trinitarian doctrine that is here but it should be noted, I've had numerous discussions with people who believe in oneness, uh, who also defend 1 John 5, 7, not because of the Trinity, but because they believe it's teaching oneness. So again, are we doctrinally driven by this or is this, because again, obviously Dr. White and I both believe that the Father, Son, and Spirit are one. Dr. White wrote an entire book about the forgotten Trinity. I mean, to, to believe that we don't believe in the Trinity, this is what Erasmus was accused of when he didn't put it in his first two editions. Right. It's like, I mean, are you not Trinitarian anymore? And by the <laughs> way, it should be noted that even though Erasmus inserted it into his third edition, he still did not believe it belonged there. His annotation right. laid that out. So again, we're talking about the TR, which TR? Because the Luther German Bible originally was translated off of the second edition of Erasmus, which did not contain 1 John 5, 7. The reason this was a strong tradition is because it is, as Dr. White pointed out, is a Latin tradition. In fact, the earliest Greek witness we have of this manuscript is, is manuscript 629, which is a diglot. And here's how we know that the Greek reading originated, or I should say we have a good reason to believe the Greek reading originated from the Latin, not the other way around. Uh, Latin does not use the definite articles. And when you look at the Greek text in this diglot, guess what you have? No definite articles in the Greek side. Whereas if you go to the TR, you will find definite articles uh, right here. But so, so what does that indicate? The evidence would point to the fact that the Latin text influenced the Greek text. And this is the first manuscript we have of 1 John 5, 7 out of the, the 10 manuscripts. And anybody wants to know what the date, we can actually slim it down to about two years. 1362 to 1363 is the earliest known manuscript of the Kama Yohanium. Now, my friend Elijah Hickson did a count on this. Out of the 23 to 25 words, depending on which one you're looking at, there are eight differences between manuscript 629 and the current Trinitarian Bible Society's text that we have today. Eight differences. We're, we're, we're talking about one verse. As we described back in Acts 837, when you start seeing variances within itself in a short section, you have to start asking why. Well, again, if you're bringing in a tradition from the Latin, which by the way, it does go back quite a bit. And uh, I personally believe that the phrasing came from a Latin uh, creed. Uh, personally, I, I, I wouldn't surprise me if that's where it came from, I should say. I'm not dogmatic about that either, but I, I do believe it was arisen from the West. It is a tradition. Again, is the statement true? Sure. Did John write it? That's the question we're going for here. Did John write it. And I do not believe that this text is authentic. 
Uh, the manuscript tradition, especially on the Greek side, does not support it. Many of the manuscripts that do have it marginalize it, put it in the margin. I think manuscript 221 has it in the margin. There are different manuscripts that demonstrate to us that this was an insertion translated into the Greek from the Latin, not the other way around. Usually the Latin is translated from the Greek. This seems to be the reversed order. Dr. White, I believe you're about to pull it up on the manuscript. Yeah, I, 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 did, that, did that actually show up? It did. Yes, it did. Oh, okay, all right, let me, let me, let me do it again. Um, here is Codex Monportianus, and is that coming up now? Yes, sir. Okay, I just want, I, I, I grabbed it real quick. Again, I mentioned that I examined this myself uh, in, in Dublin, Ireland at Trinity College, and notice this substantiates what Stephen was just saying. Remember what he said about the articles? Look at uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This was, I wrote it down when I was there, but you can, you can see it here, right there in, in the Greek. There are no articles. But if you look at the Textus Receptus, it has the articles. So you, which, which one is the quote unquote uh, original? Which one is, the, uh, where, is that, where is that coming from is, is the question. And so I just wanted people to see that, that this, this material is still there. It's still available. It's still uh, out there to be, to be looked at. And I just want to emphasize again, if you can say that a text that disappeared from the Greek manuscript tradition is the original, then you have no basis for ever saying that what you have in the Greek manuscript tradition goes back to the original. Because I can go to early church fathers. You go to, have you ever, has anyone ever read Cyril of Alexandria? This dude was quoting stuff that I think was beamed down from an alien spaceship. We don't have a clue <laughs> where in the world he got some of the stuff that he was quoting. But if one of those quotes ended up in the TR, it would be original because it had one person that quoted it, right? That's the problem that we're dealing with here. We have to have a standard. There has to be a standard that we can utilize and we can utilize consistently. And yeah, go ahead. I was just say the consistency is if 629 is the preserved tradition that brought this in, that manuscript that we were just dealing with, in the verse prior to it, in verse six, you have the phrase, the spirit of truth. But in that manuscript, you have Christ instead of the spirit, which is a part of that manuscript, which again comes from the Latin. So when we go to the TR, if that's the preserved line that introduces us to the preserved reading, because it's the oldest witness of it, why doesn't the TR have Christ in place of spirit there? Again, when we, when we go to this one small element of evidence. I'm not saying we just take the manuscripts and throw them out. I'm not saying we don't acknowledge what they say, but if that becomes the standard, if 629 becomes the standard, we got internal problems with variances. We have a influence of the Latin being a diglot, like Dr. White just showed in that in the other manuscript, we have missing articles influenced by the Latin. And now you have readings that also come over from the Latin that the TR did not pick up. Like is is it the spirit of truth or, or is Christ truth? Like what, what are we dealing with here? Because there is no standard for them. It is, here's the standard. It's the blue bound book. If it contradicts, we have to make it mold. It doesn't matter what we cut out. It doesn't matter what we add in. It doesn't matter what church father we quote. This is problematic. Another manuscript is GA 61, which seems to be <clears throat> a copy of manuscript 326, 326. I believe it's in the Catholic epistles. And, and, and that's important to know, too, because it diverts, it, it goes away in places from the TR again. So it's like, all right, well, these are the manuscripts that support the TR. Did you read the rest of the manuscript in the verse before and the whole chapter itself? Now we're introduced to a whole new realm of variances. So if that one or two manuscripts out of the 10 that actually become the standard, then we have to make it the standard in the whole chapter and the whole book not just in one verse where we want it to fit with our presupposition of the, of, of the Scrivener's text. When we look at the evidence, we have to weigh it against the others. That is where a critical text position like myself and Dr. White, we can look at a manuscript and say, this is a valuable note to have. This one has no weight 
against the wealth of the other evidences of manuscripts and, tradi and, and translations and citations of the fathers. It is overwhelmingly against it. But here it makes a good point because it actually agrees here. We're not looking at it as one single standard. You have to weigh the evidence at each variant. And they do not have a standard to do that. Oh, thank you guys for, for that. And we do have a, a series of questions coming up for you guys. Uh, uh, well, first one, uh, thank you, Finding Truth, for your super chat. Question for both. What would you say to Muslims who might use this conversation to say that the Bible is corrupted? By the way, shout out to Dr. Boyce and Dr. White. Now, you kind of addressed this already uh, in, 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 in your discussion, but if you just want to say a brief word on that. Yeah, well, you know, uh, one of the last in-person debates I got to do last year in Durban, South Africa, um, a Muslim got up and asked this question. And as I began to respond to it, he walked back to his chair and started talking to his neighbor while I was trying to answer the question. And I, I called him out. You can watch it. It's on YouTube. I was debating Yusuf Ismail. I called him out on it. And I called him out rather strongly because I was saying, you're not concerned about what this actually means. You need to hear what this actually means. What, what the answer was. And he ended up coming back up afterwards. We had a good conversation because I, I did call him out on it. And so if you'd like to see how this works in a real situation with a majority Muslim audience, look up the debate that I did in Durban, South Africa last year with, uh, with Yusuf Ismail. Um, but this has to cause us to define what the term corruption means. If corruption means that there are variations in manuscripts, Every ancient text is corrupted on that level, including the Quran. The recent comments by Yasser, Dr. Yasser Qadi um, on this very subject created a firestorm amongst Muslims, but it shouldn't have. If they've read their own history, if they've read their own scholars, they should be aware of the fact. Uh, you, can, you can buy the top copy manuscript of the Quran and in the beginning, if you open it up, there is a table of major differences between the Mus'haf of the Quran, where there are different readings between any handwritten document from antiquity has textual variants in it. That is a reality. So when you're talking to Muslims, however, 99.9% .9 of them do not know anything about the textual history of the transmission of the Quran. Now, just in passing, the Quran is a much younger book than the New Testament. So it only had to go through a much shorter number of centuries of hand transmission than the New Testament did, and certainly than the Old Testament did, because you're talking about codification around the year 700 or so, and you know printing is, in, is, is invented not all that long after that time period. It's more of a medieval book than an ancient book. But the point is, the Quran has textual variants they don't have yet a critical edition of the Quran. So when I, even, even Stephanus, I won't hold it up again, but when I, when I hold up the, uh, the Tyndale House, there are notes down at the bottom of the page. There's many more in the Nessial and many more in the UBS, but this has a critical text in it that allows you to see major variants. You won't find that in an Arabic edition of, of the Quran. Uh, could they create such a thing? Yes, they could, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. And the people pushing to produce it are from the West, not primarily from Islam. And so I think the Muslim needs to recognize that there are variants in the text of the Quran and that the issue is how was a text transmitted to us? Now, I'm not gonna, if we wanna do this later on when we address the, the issue with the government official, we can do that, but Take the time to go to YouTube and listen to the two debates that I've done with two different Muslim apologists, Adnan Rashid and Yusuf Ismail. One was at Northwest University in Pachasum, South Africa. The other was in London. Because I bring out the issue of the means of the transmission of the text. The New Testament was transmitted freely. There was no government control and editing of the process of the transmission of the text of the New Testament. The Quran was not transmitted freely. It's a controlled transmission. Sahih al-Bukhari, volume six, pages 509 and 510, 
contain the story of the Uthmanic revision. There are other evidences of other official interruptions of the transmission of the text. This fundamentally diminishes the reliability of the resulting manuscript tradition. If you have a wholesale editing taking place, then your transmission of the, of the manuscript tradition can only take you back to then, not earlier than that. And so there is a fundamental difference in how the New Testament was transmitted and how the Quran was transmitted and the New Testament is transmitted in a much better way than the Quran was transmitted. Dr. Stephen, you want to weigh in on that? I would just say, I've said this before, the greatest method of preservation was the Great Commission. When right. the gospel message went into all the world, the documents went with it. What does Amen. that mean? It means it prevented it be, by being controlled by one church, one person, one institution. And it was not just transmitted into the world, it was translated into the world and it was quoted into the world so that when there was any sense of changing, and we might get into this later, that was known by the churches. They were instantly picking up on things. Even Jerome, people were corrupting his work on the Psalms on the other side of the sea, and he got word back that somebody was changing stuff, and he wrote a response to it. They were fully aware of what was being passed on, and when Marcion's work came in in corruption, people knew the churches were instantly in tune with the text of scripture that they had. The churches were not oblivious and they could not control one section. The, the Great Commission was God's method of preservation. And again, what does that look like? Well, when we take all of the evidence we have of these transmitted manuscripts that are in different parts of the world and translations, and we bring it together, what do we come up with? Less than 2% of all textual variances are actually legitimately viable and meaningful and not a single cardinal doctrine is hinging on any of that less than 2%. Folks, that is preservation. That is how God preserved his word. We want God to give us a Bible that floats down on cloud nine with the TR on the left, King James in the middle, and the Masoretic text on the right. And that's just not how God did it. In fact, if it was only transmitted from one location, we're in the same boat with the Quran. The fact that it distributed and still remained the same message without being controlled by a single church, institution, group, or person is evidence that God knew what he was doing when he preserved his word by getting the message into the world. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. We, we, I'm going to try and combine two questions together here. Uh, FSC says priority question. So will you guys address the grammatical error in the critical text that occurs when the comma, uh, the, the Johannian comma uh, is omitted and uh, Nick say, uh, kind of adds to that, uh, not in the same line, but I think it's related. It says world leading expert, world leading Greek expert, Professor Georgios Babinoitis told me recently that the text is butchered without a comma. Uh, so uh, dealing with the, the flow of the text, I guess, in First John chapter five, how would you yeah. any one of you would like to respond to that? Um, with all due respect, it's a bogus argument. Um, uh, this has been uh, taken apart very well. In fact, interestingly enough, I, I did a quick Google search and there is an excellent article on James Snap Jr.'s website uh, taking this apart thoroughly and walking through uh, parallel passages in 1 John uh, where you have the very same constructions in regards to masculines and neuters uh, nouns and pronouns um, that you have uh, allegedly in 1 John 5. As it stands in the critical text, there is no grammatical error whatsoever in the text. You can find John using the same kind of language elsewhere uh, as you have in the critical text. As it stands today, there is no need for the Kami Johannium, and this is not how you do textual criticism. Wouldn't it be nice if it read this way? Well, let's wait for 1400 years to find a manuscript that does that based upon Latin. This is not how you do textual criticism. It is um, exasperating to encounter this kind of thing, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and um, so, yeah, uh, I, James Snap obviously has criticized me for a long, long, long time. I, I wish I could communicate to him the fact that I, I, I really like the guy and I think he's just got an awesome beard too. I, I think he just needs to, needs to hear that. He has a, he has a really cool beard. Um, but uh, he has, an, it was actually a guest written article 
that debunks that entire thing goes very much into depth. The comments that I've seen posted by people from these alleged Greek uh, experts did not go into depth, did not demonstrate a knowledge of what the issues were at all. They were just authoritative statements rather than actually going to the text and substantiating it. So um, there is no error, there is no grammatical error as it stands uh, and John, John's language. I, I've led people, I've taught Greek since, oh good grief, I've lost track, some, sometime in the 1980s. And we almost always read First John as, as part of uh, that first year Greek class. And you can read through this and no one is gonna be sitting there going, I can't read this because there's a grammatical error. No, there's not. That's just simply not true. Stephen, do you want to quickly yeah, say something? The, the, the argument is the substantive participle or adjective is the argument they're going for here. And that is basically <clears throat> that an adjective can act as a noun to, to connect with these different forms of the words. For example, the argument they're trying to make is two, that it does not parallel. Uh, meaning there's no power. If you take verse seven out, there's no parallel. The question is, why do we need a parallel? If verse seven doesn't belong there, what you have is a proclamation, a summary, and a conclusion, which is actually far more clean in the text than parallel. In fact, John does more parallel work in his gospel writing than in his epistle. I'm not saying he doesn't do parallelisms in places, but this wasn't a place for him to be demonstrating some sort of parallel nature. He's affirming a witness he's already established in verse six. He has brought that witness from heaven to earth, affirmed it in both places. There's no need for a parallel. The argument that was made was that, well, there is no parallel here if you remove it. Why do you need one? You have an, a proclamation, a defense, and a conclusion. That's all you need. Also, the argument of, well, Greek scholars say, when we start doing that, we're going to have names on both sides. Because there's numerous people, and here's the argument that Nick, I believe, continues to make about me and Dr. White, is like, well, you're not native Greeks, and uh, you know, you're not fluent in it, that's not your main language. Okay, well, let's just say that's a viable argument, which I don't think it is, because we've studied the language. We're no by no means perfect in it, uh, always learning something new. But let's just say that's the case. There are guys that are on the Nestle and Allen editions and so forth. They're Greek. Are, are they idiots? I mean, like, at what point do we, we lose that argument? And I find this extremely diverting from the evidence. We, the, the argument used to be on the evidence, and I didn't realize until talking to Dr. White the other day that you know, this was a 90s debate argument. Oh, yeah. uh, but, but what we're looking at is this. So let's just play the game for a minute substantive participles and adjectives. And let's just say that's the case because you have, what, here's the argument. You have a masculine adjective and three neuters. That's the argument. Therefore, it is grammatically incorrect. Well, if that's the case, we need to go back a couple of chapters uh, into chapter two, verse 16. You have hati panta ento cosmo, which is a neuter substantive phrase in First John chapter two, verse 16. And guess what? It is then given three feminines with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and pride. Well, then we have a grammatical problem because the substantive phrase is not matching up. But again, this is where we can actually use that rule to show that we are actually being consistent and it's actually serving a different person purpose in the text. Also, may I add in verse number eight, you have the same grammatical problem. Let's say the TR has it right and verse seven belongs there. You right. still run into this problem in verse number eight. Why do I say that? Because the witness in verse number eight is attaching itself as a, the witness adjective is an adjective and it's masculine. And guess what you have in the passage here? You have three neuters following in verse eight, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Three neuters going back to the witness that is a masculine. You have the same problem even with verse seven. So if this is a grammatical problem, we have three grammatical problems within two chapters of themselves in the epistle of first John by itself, but it's not a grammatical problem. Uh, if we understand the concept of, um, sub go ahead, Dr. White, were you about to say something? No, no, I was saying it's not a grammatical problem. I was just, I was confirming exactly what you're saying. And you look, you look at the last phrase, kai hoi trais ais ta hen eisen, the three, when, if people just understood the utilization of neuters 
in the language of the day to gather together other things, they, they, they wouldn't be having any of these issues. This is a bogus argument that is meant, uh, again, how can you use a grammatical argument to substantiate a reading that no one reading this text for 1,000 years ever saw? That's what is being avoided. That's what is being covered for. If this is original, all the grammatical stuff is, is out the window. It doesn't matter. We don't know what the original New Testament read in the first place, if this is original. That's what's uh, under, Understanding attributive adjectives and, and, and different things like this will actually help us understand the structure better. And that happens quite frequently with the noun pneuma. Uh, constantly showing up in the neuter all throughout the scripture. So again, we have to, if we're going to apply this rule here, we're going to have to go through the whole New Testament, start weeding out verses that all of a sudden we like, and now, nope, can't work. It's grammatically not proper. This is not the only place we have to deal with this in the, in the New Testament. Thank you guys for that. Now, um, two questions came in the same uh, from Robert Trulove, and I guess that Tanner Dinkin uh, sent a super chat. Thank you, Tanner, for that. Uh, and it's the, basically uh, repeating Robert Trulove's question. Do we have an absolute canonical authority or are we, st or are we still waiting for it? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I would simply point out that simply holding this up and saying, this is it, does not provide you with an absolute canonical authority. So I would ask, what is an absolute canonical authority? Uh, history and God's working with his people is the best canonical authority that we have. That is, when we look at how God gave us the Old Testament text, Jesus's affirmation of that process, and then see it in the New Testament, that's the canonical authority. That's not the same thing as a textual authority. TR only people completely and inappropriately grab hold of canon argumentation and try to apply it to individual variant readings. Dr. Kruger himself is well aware of the fact that TR only people abuse his own yes. arguments in this way and has repudiated <laughs> that. This is a very common thing. I've tried to point out to them. This is not what he's saying, but we have to differentiate between a canonical authority. There is, there is, you can talk about the gospel of John in the church and its authority without addressing a variant on whether there is a article or not an article in one verse in the Gospel of John. To conflate those two things is to cross categories and create absolute confusion. And that's what you have in, when you try to take canon arguments and apply them to this here. You create endless problems. And so I would ask, well, what do you mean, what, what canonical authority? Is, is, do you need a council? Do you need a reformation? I would like to know when the reformed churches ever got together and decided any of these texts. I'd like to see that. When did the reformed churches get together and determine the proper reading of Luke 2.22? I've been asking that question since the 90s, and I can prove it. Go back and read my written dialogue, my written debate with Doug Wilson, on the issue of the ecclesiastical text from about 1995, 96. That's the exact text I asked him about. When has the church ever gathered together and given an authoritative proclamation on the proper reading of Luke 2.22? They don't have an answer because it's never happened. There is no quote unquote ecclesiastical decision on the reading of Luke 2.22 or Ephesians 3, 9, or Revelation 16, 5. But what you do have over history is unanimous understanding of the gospel of Luke as a gospel. And if you can't see what the difference between those two things are, you're going to have a real problem dealing with history itself. Yeah, it's very concerning to me that the confessional viewpoint has affirmed a canon in the Reformation when the churches throughout the ages held a canon from day one. The New Testament churches had a canon. It was the Old Testament. And as the apostles were teaching and writing, the canon is not something that was, was something that was chosen by the churches. It was not something that was picked by the churches. There's only one council that ever met to pick books. 
That was the Council of Trent. That was much, much later. And that was in response to the Reformation. So when we go back earlier, what are we looking at? We're looking at the fact that, for example, uh, the Council of Carthage, when they were writing to Rome, they had begun to receive books that they did not recognize and read very carefully what they said, handed to us from the apostles, received by the fathers. They did not say we picked them. They said they had received them. And so they're, they're, these Gnostic texts start coming into the equation. There's corruptions coming in, these plagiarized works. And what do they do? They write to the bishops up in, in Rome. And they're saying, these are the books that we have received. Not chose, received. Check your list. Are these the same books? Guess what? Rome responds back, same 27 New Testament books. They didn't make a choice. They were comparing notes of what they had received. So when we start going into, well, the, the, the Reformation picked our books and that we didn't have a complete canon until then, man, we are really messing up because I believe the canon is finalized after the New Testament authors had finished penning the original document. It was canonized in that moment and that the churches were not picking a canon. They were discovering a canon. And, and that was very, very early. We see New Testament writers quoting themselves. Peter refers back to the Gospels. It seems like Paul talks about the Gospel of Luke when he's quoting from Luke. In fact, it's often believed by the fathers that when he said, according to my Gospel, he was referring to the Gospel of Luke. They already looked at their work as theonustas. They were already looking at his inspired text. So I, when we start bringing in canonization into the Reformation, I cringe, I cringe, I cringe, because we have lost our argument for a defense of the Scripture all through the ages that give us the greatest defense of the canon. I think the Reformation did a little bit of hurt to the canon. They put question on books that should not have been questioned, like Revelation. Luther struggled with some of the writings coming from James and Hebrews based on his methodology of canonization. I'm not saying he didn't come around on it, but I would say the Reformation caused more questions than it did answers. That's just my opinion. Thank you guys for that. Now, we do have one short question before we go to Revelation 16.5. Oh, sure, sure. That is short question. I've heard that one before. Uh, <laughs> it is. I, I can promise you this will be a really short one. Can we have the name of the article by James Snap? I was right oh. on this one. <laughs> um, I'll get it out of my history and uh, and we'll let's just press on. I'll pull it out of the history thing. I sent it to you, Stephen. It may be, it, I think it's in your messenger thing, but I'll 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 pull it down. Thank you for that, Doctor White. Now, so. Uh, Sahih Luke, uh, we'll, we'll respond to you on that as soon as we can. So we move on to Revelation 16.5, uh, and this will be the last, uh, I, I, I guess, unless uh, Dr. James White and Dr. Stephen Boyce want to go to the fifth. Uh, this, I suspect, will be the last. And also, for those of you just waking up in Malaysia, good morning to you. We'll be responding to YB Zawawi's claim uh, right immediately after Revelation 16.5. Okay, uh, I've got it. It's, uh, the website is called thetextofthegospels.com. It's from uh, August of 2018, the Kama Yohanium and Greek Grammar.html. Each word has a dash in between it. Uh, it's by Dr. Barry Hofstetter, and it's again the dash, comma, dash, Yohanium, comma, Yohanium and Greek Grammar.html at the text of the Gospels.com. Thank you for that. So uh, we're going to go to Revelation 16.5. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the ESV reads, and I Heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. And, and uh, you have the King James Version saying, And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. Um, thoughts on that one, uh, either Dr. Stephen Boyce or uh, Dr. James White. It's all yours, Stephen. <laughs> Well, the question is, is why, why are we talking about this verse? Again, it goes back to the fact that it was picked by the King James translators because no TR edition up till 1582 when Theodore Beza inserted this into his text. And he told us why, thankfully. We know why he inserted this in the text. Uh, Erasmus did not accept this. Uh, Stephanus did not accept this. In fact, uh, I, I, I want to make this clear before I read the quote. Most people do not realize this, but after Beza had died, the year the King James was completed, there was an additional um, addition that came out for Beza in 1611, and his editors actually changed the reading back. And then later, the early versions of the Elzevir nephew and uncle, they did not have this, but then they inserted it later, once again, to parallel with the King James. 
But Mills followed Stephanus on this in 1707. Uh, many of the years and years and years of the TR tradition did not accept this. Most years of the TR has existed. The writers and editors did not accept this reading. This is a Beza issue. Uh, and so Beza inserted this in 1582. It followed his tradition in 1598, which is one of the main sources for the King James translators. But this is what Beza said in his annotations. When John sets forth the name of Jehovah in all other places, as we have certainly stated in 1.4. So here's what, here is what Beza is doing. He's recognizing the term Jehovah. There's two variances in this verse, not one. There's two. Um, he's assuming that kurios here, uh, the form of kurios here, is the standard set for how this tridact formula starts coming out. And so he recognizes that this happens all through Revelation, chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 4, verse 18, chapter 11, verse 17. He recognizes Jehovah sets the standard to this, the one who was and is and is to come. And he realizes that it's different here. Now, it should be noted that Jehovah has very, 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 very little evidence at all. In fact, there's only one Greek manuscript that even has that word there, and that's minuscule 2344, which is an 11th century manuscript. It's the only Greek manuscript that has Lord here. Now, we know the manuscript that Erasmus was using in Revelation that we have of does not have Lord here. Now, the Latin seems to bring it in, but even Erasmus's text did not have the word Lord, which he is assuming to be Jehovah. One single Greek manuscript, 11th century. But if again, if we're going to use that as the standard, then let's keep going back to chapter 13, verse 18, where that same manuscript has the mark of the beast as 665. So we have a different mark of the beast in that manuscript. So if we're going to accept it as the standard, then let's change the mark of the beast too. But let's just say it belongs there. So here's his argument. The word Jehovah is here. And keep in mind, Stephanus and Beza did not really go behind Erasmus too much on Revelation. The reformers were not very fond of the book of Revelation as we would like them to be. So they didn't really give much thought to it, although Beza tried. But here's another situation where Beza's thinking became textual criticism, his thought process. And so you have Kai uh, or comment. Uh, or, or Kamenos in the rest of the passages, I believe is how it reads. And here he puts a Samanos instead. He, he realizes, oh, wait, the future form of this, the one who shall be, is actually the proper Greek structure here. And so he believes, not off evidence, he admits he doesn't have any evidence of this, but that the genuine reading is being restored by his thought process of harmonization in the rest of Revelation. From chapter 1, verse 4, 1, 8, 4, 8, 11, 17, he believes that in harmonizing these, he must insert, which is a conjectural emendation. He's inserting his thought process and opinion. These have to read the same. And so he changes it, believing, and he says that he has restored the book from the older and good faithful manuscripts, which, by the way, he did not have. Uh, he claims that he's restoring an old, old reading in the old manuscripts, and he did not have an old manuscript to base this off of. So he restores it to this reading, and lo and behold, in the TR today, we have no longer Hasios, the Holy One. We now have the one who is to come, and he harmonizes the previous three settings. So again, Erasmus rejected this. Uh, Stephanus rejected this. Bayes' editors later rejected this. Mills rejected this. It is absolutely ridiculous to believe that this reading is authentic. There are no manuscripts that have this reading, zero zilch, that have it in the Greek text. And the only reason that Beza was even using this argument was on an assumption that the word Lord belonged there, and there's no reason to believe it belongs there. This whole thing is like watching dominoes fall down. It's not defendable. I don't know why anybody would try to defend this as authentic. Dr. White, would you like to add anything to that? I think that's a Excellent summary. I, I held up my 1550 Stephanos because uh, it, it has Hasios uh, in, its, in its text. Um, and again, I just simply have to point out, this is how Christians have read this all along. Um, aren't we just being a little bit, I don't know, um, arrogant to say, well, we don't care how Christians have read this for uh, 1600 years. Uh, we've come up with a new reading and it's the original. And once again, if this is the original, then that original reading can simply disappear 
out of the very text of, uh, of the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Now, obviously the book of Revelation, very unusual book and a highly unique textual transmission. Okay, everybody who says textual critical stuff, I, I know that Revelation is gonna be the last CBGM volume, <laughs> the last volume of the ECM to come out uh, because I imagine that you're gonna need a, a supercomputer to run CBGM on the manuscript Revelation, even though we have fewer manuscripts for Revelation we have any other book uh, because of its canonical uh, struggles in, in the early church. But it is fascinating to recognize that Erasmus really almost viewed dealing with Revelation as a afterthought. Um, we know that he only used one manuscript in preparation of it. He actually extracted the Greek text from a Latin commentary. Uh, that's why you have the problems at the end of the, of the uh, uh, Revelation chapter 22. And what's fascinating to me, I learned something only last year. I had always wondered, uh, why was it that Erasmus has these problems, like at the end of the book of Revelation, in his first edition, and he has them all the way through to the fifth edition? Why, weren't, why, wasn't, the, why wasn't this fixed in the process? And then I found out that between the first and second editions, he knew of another uh, Greek New Testament that had been published by someone else. And so he instructed his printers before his second edition, go get theirs and use their book of Revelation and fix mine. Not knowing that they had used his first edition for their book of Revelation. So the printer may have done it, but it wouldn't have made any difference because they were copying off of each other. And so he not knowing this figured that the fixes were already done and they're just there just wasn't that much emphasis upon being overly concerned. Again, Erasmus did not think he was producing the final edition of the Greek New Testament by any stretch of the imagination. So you have to, if you're going to say there's some providential thing going on here, you've got to say, and he was using a Roman Catholic priest who had no clue that he was actually doing this, in fact, thought the exact opposite, who was making the actual textual choices that are primarily, in this instance, not Beza goes another direction, but are primarily what's behind the readings in the book of Revelation in everything that comes after this. And so when you recognize that Revelation 16.5 is a dual variant and that the evocative form of kudios, kudi, is almost not testified there at all, then all of, all of this, as Stephen said, it's a, it's a house of cards that, that, that comes down. And again, I want to know what John wrote. I want to know what John wrote. I don't think a TR-only advocate can look me in the eye and say, I want to know what John wrote. Because that's not how they're behaving when they deal with the text. And again, any methodology you use to delete Hasios from Revelation 16.5 is not the, re the methodology that you would use over in Revelation 14, 1 for the variant there. It's not what you used in the Kama Yohanim. It's not what you use in Acts 8, 37. And it's not what you use in Luke 2, 22 or Ephesians 3, 9. You have to use different arguments for each and every one of them. That is a refutation to any person who will stand back and just go, you know, you can't talk about the word truthfulness without using descriptives of consistency. Yeah, and, and so, and, and what's being argued from this text today is not the argument that um, Beza was making. Beza was not making the argument from manuscripts. He, he admitted why he made the change. It was his understanding of how it was used in the previous places in the book. He made a change on his understanding that it needed to be harmonized and then needed to be changed and it needed to be updated in order to fit the previous four locations. He didn't cite any manuscripts. He, think, he thinks he restored old manuscripts, but he didn't say, I have manuscripts and I'm fixing it from the manuscripts. That wasn't his argument for changing. And so if I'm going to be a TR advocate, I'm, I'm sticking with Stephanus on this one. I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, hey, Beza, you're out, bud. I mean, you have no evidence. Erasmus said different. Uh, your own editors don't agree with you. Uh, the 1611 edition changes it back to Hasios. Hey, that... I wonder, I often wonder, 
so much if the King James waited another 10 years to be translated, if they would have followed the 1611 edition of Beza instead of the 1598. I don't know, but I do know this. The King James has a part in this. If this reading was in the King James, if this reading was changed and the King James translators went with Stephanus here, right. this subject and argument would not be happening. It comes exactly. back to the King James. Exactly. I mean, th there was a committee that's translating Revelation. They've got the 1550 Stephanus. They've got the 1598 Beza. They made a human decision. Yes. That goes against all the manuscripts. And every TR only advocate is having to say they were inspired to do that. Yes. Oh, thank you guys for that. That was enlightening on Revelation 16.5. We do have a few questions, at least for now. Okay, you never know when the list is going to expand. Uh, first one from Robert True Love is for Revelation 16.5, the canonical argument for the TR hinges not upon a Bezos edition. Um, any comments on that one? I'm glad to hear that. Uh, yeah. I'm glad so to hear which, that. Which, <laughs> so which TR are we supposed to, is, is the canonical one here? What, which, which one? Because see, as soon as, as, you know, Stephen brought up the fact that Bayes' own editors put in a different reading. Is that a TR? As soon as you have to start comparing these and doing text criticism on these, your argument's done. Your, your argument is finished. You cannot continue to say, well, we have this absolute standard and, and therefore we don't even have to do human reasoning. You're doing human reasoning. The authors of your text did human reasoning. You're just being inconsistent as to where you identify the human reasoning at. That's all. 100% agree. Right. Um, yeah, Stephen, do you want to add anything to that, Stephen? No, no, that was perfect. Right. All right. Um, now, Ariel Gonzalez, uh, just a, a new question that came in. Just thought uh, I'll pop it up. You may have answered this question before. Uh, would Dr. White be interested in debating Dr. James Knapp on a given topic in textual criticism? Uh, you know, after watching the fascinating exchange between Peter Gurry, James Snap, and Jeffrey Riddle, and of course, we might want to remind folks, as it's been over two hours since we got started, uh, that October 2nd and 3rd, uh, we're going to be doing those debates with uh, Dr. Riddle um, on uh, the uh, longer ending of Mark and on Ephesians 3.9. Um, what I would like to do is debate James Snap on the theology of John 6. That's what I'd like to do. Um, I, I, I put that out there. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, what, what in these areas, on Ephesians 3, 9, he agrees with me. Um, he would agree with me on Revelation 16, 5, on these areas. So any other area, see, James Snap does textual criticism. We can actually talk about manuscripts and they're meaningful. They're not meaningful to see our only position because it doesn't matter what the manuscripts read. It, it honestly does not matter. That, that's the point of what Stephen's been saying. If this, if, if the King James had gone with a different reading, if the King James, because you know that when they're sitting there in, in, their, in their room, uh, meeting as a, as a committee, translating the book of Revelation, Somebody had the 1550 Stephanus and somebody had the 1598 Beza and they saw the difference and they made a choice. If they had made a different choice, we wouldn't be discussing this. So that's where TR onlyism comes down to. And that's why James Snap disagrees with it. That's why James Snap said the things that he did in that debate. So these issues are, are different. This is different. In a, a conversation that James Snap and I would have on John 118, we're going to be talking manuscripts. We're going to be talking dating of manuscripts. We're going to be talking about antiquity of manuscripts and things like that. Completely different foundation and basis than what we're talking about here because the manuscripts don't matter in the TR only position. They just don't. They're, they're, they're side furniture. But if, if, if you couldn't find a single manuscript that did read as the TR, it wouldn't make any difference. Because once your theological conclusion is that this is the providentially preserved text, the manuscripts don't matter anymore. 
Well, we do have a question from R.A. Fuentes, and uh, this may be the last question, uh, at least of what I've received. So now, for now, yeah, on... talk about the, uh, the the Muslim thing. We got to get to it here eventually. Right. Okay. We're going to go. Uh, shall I? Would you like me to ask this question, or would you like me to go yeah, straight go to the Muslim? Okay. I'm just saying we need to get to it. Got it. So uh, we, we're just going to ask this question and go straight to the last one. So uh, Ari Fuentes apologetics to Dr. White. Uh, Dr. White says, I want to know what John wrote. Sounds familiar. Wasn't that the question Satan in the Garden of Eden uh, had God uh, said? Um, any, just any brief response to that? That shows a level of confusion that is really hard for me to know how to respond to. Satan was asking Eve who had heard what God said to question what God said. We are talking about wanting to know what the apostles themselves actually wrote because what they wrote has been transmitted to us in written form over the course of 2000 years. That is a category error that is stunning in being able to even parallel the two. I'm sorry if I'm being straightforward, but that is not a thoughtful question. And that seems to me to be an objection uh, dressed up as a question, but it's not an actual meaningful question because the fact of the matter is I was not in the room when Paul wrote the book of Romans. And so it is a perfectly appropriate question to ask, how can we know what has been transmitted to us over time through the church, through the transmission process, in God's providence. That is not the same question that was asked directly to Eve who heard God speak directly. Two completely different things. Yeah. <clears throat> that question was asked all the time, um, especially where I went to schooling and things like that is, uh, can you really question what God has said? Well, you've already established that what that text is, is what every word that God said. And again, when we look at Revelation 16, 5, that's what Beza said. Because it's not what Stephanus said. It's not what, because, that, because Stephanus was going off of the evidence. Erasmus was going off of the evidence. Beza was not going off of evidence. He was going off of what was in his mind. So why should I conclude what God said is what Beza said? And not Stephanus. I, I, the, the parallels in Genesis 3 do not fit fit what we're talking about here because again when you look at uh, i'll go back to the examples the the churches down in north africa at carthage writing to the churches in the west who had their list do you realize that the books of the bible ended up being the same but how they read in every place did not the churches in carthage had nuances and, and variances in their text from the ones in rome but they had the same books and the overall same message but guess what? Though they were affirming the same books, the readings were different. So who had it? Was Rome, a you know, were they not missing God's word? They just missed out on God's best blessings of preservation and the people in Carthage had it? I mean, where do we go with this argument? I just, I cannot cope with it anymore. I know that was a question that was asked to me all the time. The parallels are not there. What Satan was asking Eve was not in the same realm, but we're asking about the evidence. We're asking about the evidence. We want to know what God said. We're not trying to get rid of what God said. We're trying to get back to it because we believe God moved writers to put it on manuscripts that were passed down and he said he would protect it. We're not looking to build the text and find and create one. We're looking to discover the one that was already there. And you have to use sexual criticism. Beza used sexual criticism. Erasmus used sexual criticism. They made choices. All of them made choices. True. Sure. Oh, guys, thank you very much for that. Now we'd come to the final part of our live stream today. It's taken a while to come here. Uh, and uh, it's going to be dealing with uh, a comment made in uh, the Malaysian parliament uh, for, for context. Uh, uh, you know, so what happened in the Malaysian parliament is there was discussion on alcohol. Uh, and I'm just summing this up real quick. Um, and uh, we have a minister of parliament in Malaysia, YB, uh, Dr. Zawawi, uh, who is a Muslim. Uh, and basically what he did is he, he, he said that, you know, all religions condemn uh, you know, the, the consumption of alcohol. At this point, a Christian in parliament stands up. Uh, I kind of tries to correct him saying that, well, uh, well, the Bible doesn't condemn the consumption of alcohol. It only forbids drunkenness, uh, to which uh, YB Dr. Zawawi says that, uh, well, uh, your, your Bible has been 
uh, changed or distorted, I believe is the translation of the Malay word he used. So uh, now this is a question that, you know, Christians in Malaysia have uh, been demanding an apology. One of the things I felt is that uh, this is a good opportunity to actually present some light on that. And since Dr. White and Dr. Stephen Boyce are coming here, instead of demanding an apology, now I don't know about you, I don't see the apostles demanding an apology when people said things about them, but I see them responding with gentleness and respect. So uh, that's what my conviction is at least. Um, and uh, so I just want to ask Dr. James White and uh, Dr. Stephen Boyce, experts on the area of textual criticism, please tell us, uh, how would you respond to that? Well, uh, obviously this is a subject I've addressed many, many, many times over the past number of decades in you know, standing with Muslims. There's all sorts of pictures that, I, that mean a great deal to me of standing with Muslims uh, after debates, having excellent conversations with them and being able to answer so many of these questions. What the gentleman said is a common Islamic understanding. And historically, there are two streams of understanding coming down through the Islamic sources from the Hadith into the various um, forms of the Sharia law and the commentaries and things like that. And that is the one stream of Muslim thought, understanding that the Quran teaches that the Torah and Injil, the law and the gospel, were natsal, they were sent down by Allah. And so there have been Muslims down through the ages who are like, well, look, if the Torah and Injil are sent down, we don't like the idea that the actual words could be changed themselves. Uh, this is called tarif, the, the, the corruption of the text. It can be tarif al-nas or tarif al-mana. So it is in one stream, the idea is that the interpretation of the words, the meaning of the words has been altered or changed, that they are misinterpreting the text. I think that's the earliest in the Islamic commentary. Some people would disagree with that, but I think that it is. And then a little bit later on, especially once Islam begins interacting with Christian scholarship, having to do so once sort of the borders have been established of the Islamic empire and, and, and the Byzantine and so on and so forth, then you start getting accusations that Christians and Jews have actually altered the, the words themselves. They've changed the words of the text. And you have both those streams going down through history until 1864. And in 1864, you have the publication by an Indian uh, Muslim scholar of it's our it's a uh, the 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 uh, affirmation or proof of the truth. And what he did is he went into German liberal sources and basically wrote a book against the Bible utilizing these sources and alleging all sorts of contradictions and errors and, and things like that. Not, not uncommon that you'd find an atheist using or things like that. That book had a massive influence in the Islamic world. In fact, uh, Ahmed Didat, the most listened to Muslim speaker in the modern age, died I think 2005, said that he was made a, a da'i, a, a person who does da'wah by reading its al haq So that, that book made him who he was. Now, I would point out that Ahmadidat's scholarship on issues of the Bible was horrific, and that would represent the fact that its al haqs scholarship is horrific as well. Uh, it has been thoroughly refuted by Christian scholars for ever since it was written, really. But Muslims don't know that. And so what has happened is, though there were two streams, the one stream that says the Bible has been corrupted in its words has become by far the majority, 99.5% minimally of the Muslims you're going to encounter really do believe that we don't have any idea what the New Testament originally said. We're talking corruption here, not whether it's Hasias or Asamanas in Revelation 16.5, we're talking about corruption on a grand scale of insertion of doctrine, taking out of doctrine that the whole nine yards uh, is what the average Muslim believes. So this man was not saying something that is not unusual for Muslims to believe all over the world. I've done street preaching in London and talk with, standing there talking with Muslims, and that's exactly 
what they said. That's exactly what they believe. So he's not, he's just saying what he himself has been taught. Here's the problem. This, there is an internal contradiction in Islamic theology. In Surah 5, Surah Al-Maida, in the Quran, you have the presentation of an argument on the part of the Quran. Now remember, in Islamic theology, the Quran has nothing to do with Muhammad. Muhammad, this is not Muhammad's understandings. This is not Muhammad's interpretations. Um, this, this is, the Quran is written on the heavenly tablet. It is dictated to the angel Jibril, brought down on the Layla al Qadr, and it is dictated to Muhammad. He's simply repeating it. His understanding is, is irrelevant at this point. From the, especially Sunni Islamic perspective. And so in the Quran, there is an argument that's presented beginning in Surah 544, Ayah 44, where Allah sends down the Torah. He gives it to Moses. And therefore, the people of the book are to judge by what is in the Torah because it's been sent down. Then, so you've got revelation to Moses, Torah. Then you've got Jesus who comes along and he does two things. He is given the Injil and he then confirms literally what is in the hand of the Torah. So there is a chain being forged here. So Jesus confirms the Torah that was given to Moses and he's given the Injil and the people of the Injil in Surah 547 are specifically told the Alal Injil, the people of the gospel, the followers of the Injil should have judged by what Allah revealed in it and whoever did not judge by what Allah revealed, those are they that are the transgressors. And so the people of the gospel are to judge by the gospel, okay? Then what do you think comes next? Muhammad and the Quran. And so the Quran is sent down to Muhammad and he then confirms what is in the hand of the Injil. So see the chain that's been built here, Moses to Jesus to Muhammad. So this is an important argument for the authority of Muhammad and the revelation of the Quran itself. But it causes a problem because if these words were to have any meaning in the days of Muhammad, then the Jews had to have the Torah to judge. The Christians had to have the Injil to judge or the exhortation of the Quran means nothing to them. It doesn't, it doesn't have any meaning. And so when did this corruption of the Injil or the Torah take place. If it wasn't before Muhammad, so that Surah 5 can make sense, it couldn't have been afterwards because as you know, we have entire codices of the Bible that were written long before Muhammad took his first breath. So you couldn't have corruption of the actual words because we have the actual words written down before Muhammad comes along so that would mean it would only have to be the interpretation. Apply it to your friend there, uh, the, the Muslim uh, gentleman. And the reality is the Bible is very clear in what it says about alcohol and drunkenness and the fruit of the vine and all the rest of that stuff. I don't think he was probably using the older, they perverted the meanings thing. He was probably using the more current, they actually perverted the words but the problem is that then creates an internal problem within the Quran and Surah 5 itself. This is an argument that I've presented to a number of Muslim apologists. And so far, every Muslim apologist has given me a different answer than every other Muslim apologist as to how to deal with that text in Surah Al-Maidah. So I think it's, um, uh, I, I would not be demanding apologies I would be using this as an opportunity to say, oh, so you believe this has been changed. Could we look at Surah 5 and then maybe listen to what Jesus said about how his words would never pass away or something along these lines and use that as a transition into a gospel presentation of the validity of the text. And this would also open up the opportunity to be able to talk about, and I, and I wish more Christians knew this, and if you'd Go ahead and watch my debates where I lay this out. It'll help you to understand it. 
But the fact that the New Testament transmission process, the free transmission of the text over time, is much superior to what happened with the Quran and especially with Uthman's revision, which is found in Sahih al-Bukhari. It is, it is, if you reject Sahih al-Bukhari, you are rejecting Sahih uh, hadith materials as to the transmission of the text of the Quran. Can't get into that right now, but it, it is a, a, a way of opening the door to further conversations with your Muslim friends on that subject. Thank you for that, Dr. White. I just want to ask Dr. Stephen Boyce, do you want to add uh, to that? I'll be so brief for the, for the night as far spent. Uh, but I can't add much to what Dr. White said. This is definitely his field. I, I would say this, uh, as I repeated earlier, if we missed it, the consistency of the New Testament manuscripts from the earliest stages, which we have very early attestation of, that were spread into the world in other languages and transmission of the Greek text. We have consistency, consistency, consistency. It wasn't controlled by a single church. It wasn't controlled by a single person. Uthman's revision, we don't have that problem with the New Testament. We don't have it. Uh, we do have variances. We, we, we talk about the variances. We're honest about the variances. We lay out apparatuses with the variances. We're not hiding anything. It's right there in front. What do the Christians have in their text? Where do they differ in their text? And when we bring it down to viable, meaningful, we're less than 2%. Within that less than 2%, no single cardinal doctrine is hanging off of that lesser 2%. And it's not controlled by a church. It's not controlled by an age. It's not controlled by a person. The manuscript tradition, both in the West and in the East and in North Africa and in different parts of Caesarea, the message of the gospel had maintained itself the same. And I cannot think of any textual variant, unless I am just missing something, any textual variant on drunkenness that would affect our understanding of drinking. So these assertions are just assuming the Bible's wrong. It's got to have added that in there. And, and if we're going to go off of unique things like, well, the Bible's unique in of itself there, uh, we have problems. Number one, um, not all Christians hold to a what we would call formal drinking or social drinking. Some believe in abstinence. Some Christians believe that. So you can't throw all Christians in there based even on their interpretations. Uh, and then again, if we're going to go off of, well, that's only unique to Christianity, there's a lot of things Christianity has in their text that's unique to itself. There's a lot of things in the Quran that are unique to itself. So, I mean, if that's going to be our argument, we're going to be here all night. I just think it's a very, very weak argument. I think Dr. White gave an excellent answer and explanation for it. Absolutely. And I just want to thank both Dr. White and uh, Dr. Stephen Boyce for that uh, excellent presentation, not just on the question on uh, Dr. Zawawi. Uh, and for those of you who, uh, I mean, I I'm not sure if we have the link to what he said, uh, but I, I can attest this, that he didn't provide any basis, no evidence provided, uh, just repeating the rhetoric that has been said over and over again. Uh, well, um, this has been the presentation. Uh, we don't have any more questions at this point. As, as Stephen said, the night is, uh, it's, it's getting late towards the night. And I do understand that Dr. James White has another presentation coming up not too long from now. Uh, we've got to let them go, but just want to thank both the speakers. And also for every one of you who have been watching at home, we thank you for watching this. And for those of you who contributed in the super chats, uh, today was a day where we started having it. And uh, we are a few dollars richer now. Thanks to you. Uh, so thanks so much for watching this and uh, until next time. Oh, by the way, before we go, very important, uh, Dr. James White will be back October 2nd and 3rd. Remember those dates. And uh, if you're going to forget, uh, the links to those two debates are in the description box. Uh, go and hit the notification button or subscribe to Explain Apologetics. Hit the bell so that you get notified uh, when we go live for those two debates. It's going to be debating on the longer ending of Mark and on Ephesians 3.9, both with Dr. Jeff Riddle. Friday night uh, U.S. time on uh, uh, October the 2nd and also Saturday morning U.S. time um, on uh, October the 3rd. That's a Friday, Saturday. For those of you watching in Asia, both of it is on Saturday, Saturday morning, Saturday night. Two major debates in 24 hours. Hope you can join us till then. Uh, for that one, till then, I'm Samuel Nason. And on behalf of Dr. James White and Dr. Stephen Boyce, bye for now.